Uh, for me, the personal system and, and the boat globally is the new website. And I want to say more than that, the, the semantic is really the new user experience. You will see in the next 10 years that today we've got 1 billion websites. 2015 was the year where the web arrived at more than 1 billion websites. <coughs> 1 billion websites. It's how many pages? It's how many content? It's how many knowledge that you've got directly there online that you can use. And I remember that when I started my career in programming globally, we started with an uh, application on a computer to move to <coughs> servers applications and to move to web application and to move to mobile application. And we saw that a lot of companies and people never met the switch. People was not able to say, we will move from, from uh, the computer application to web application. We will move from web application to mobile application. How many companies didn't create a mobile application? And why not? <coughs> If you, are, if you want to launch a mobile application, it's completely crazy because it's a wide ocean. It's, it's impossible. It's, I will not say that it's, it's impossible, but it's very hard. Like moving to the boat, to the semantic and personal system, is really a new area of opportunities. It's why I'm, I'm really happy that today we, are, we decided to switch, to switch uh, the, the class about collecting data and how to collect data, and it's very important, but we will come back later on this point, to deep learning for text. And um, welcome. Okay, voice check. The sound was not uh, I, I ask her because you know that I come from Belgium, you know it's like a very poor, small country <laughs> in Europe, nobody you know, and we are living at, at the edge of the farm, and stuff like that, I'm kidding. But uh, I didn't understand, uh, understood uh, the joke just because I'm really a bad customer of doctors. And you really tried to explain me what was the, and the joke. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Back. Good. Uh, so I'm going to repeat everything Greg just said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said text is cool, basically. So that's what he said. Okay. Um, uh, I just tried to give you time. Nice. <laughs> Let's have a conversation, like you know, those things where people are looking for because they just feel very friendly on the stage. <laughs> we, we, we need to teach you guys a bunch of things. Uh, so I'm going to take you through slides, about uh, 25 slides, so it's not bad. Uh, I really would like you to come out of this with a few new things in your head going, wow, I had no idea, and I'm going to read more about it or talk to my friends because that's, I had no idea this existed, okay? Um, then Greg will do plenty of real life stuff, enough for the theory, and then we'll leave you with one more. So, oopsie, Kathleen. Caffeine. You know the app caffeine? Okay. So, uh, text, you've heard of it, right? you have to hear about NLP, Natural Language Processing, a very hot subject. Everybody loves talks about text. Um, so what does NLP mean and when did it start? It started roughly in the, you know, you could probably say 50s if you really want to, but let's say 60s. I started when people have computers where they could actually take some text, type it in, and those scanners, and then realize that, my God, I can do some math on the world. Like I can count the most frequent letters, and I can count the most frequent words, and I can start organizing those things in the 
information really, uh, and then you know, let's be ambitious. They can even <coughs> start computing, you know, which world is next to which one most often, and learn stuff. So there was a man named Salter back in the sixties who was sort of the pope of this. The guy who really just started this whole thing, and then he grew and grew and grew and gave us, you know, a few small things like Google and you know, spell checking and uh, Siri. So it's sort of important. Um, <coughs> And when people talk about NLP, they usually talk about the techniques you need to solve this kind of problems. Okay, so I'll take you through that. The easiest one would be parsing worlds. Here's a piece of text. It's in English. Where are the worlds? Oh, well, you know, we have spaces, but sometimes we have punctuation. And sometimes, you know, the period at the end is really part of the thing, as in, you know, Mr. or any abbreviation. Okay, so that's called parsing. For anybody who wants to suffer, you try to do it in multiple languages. Because you do it in, yeah, you do it in English, and it's quite easy. And in most European languages, it's got to be easy because basically spaces. Then you go to more Asian like languages, and it's fun because there's often no space. Right, so Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Thai, no space. <laughs> <laughs> then you get languages which, oh, right to left. Uh, then you've got, I mean, then, then it goes on from there. I mean, Japanese is four scripts, basically. Uh, so it, it gets interesting rapidly. When you, that is not fair. I clicked on caffeine, okay? I'm not going to click entirely on this. Okay. So, um, so even something as simple as, you know, where are the worlds is not a trivial problem, okay? So, you know, you, now the good news is, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you were all up here. What you see is code, 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 because there was nothing to use. Today, some very small people that worked for a very long time, so you have a parser, which is one function call away. And Greg is going to take you through that kind of stuff. So libraries exist, you don't have to do your own, unless you have some extremely need where you need to go so fast or something like this, and even then, okay? So it's very important to be familiar with that stuff, because once you have access to the right library, it's just so easy. So it's, it's, this is something that you need to do, and this is going to be sort of one of the first things you need to be comfortable with, is just take a bunch of text and be able to make it do things very quickly. So parsing worlds, other well, things like spell checking, you start looking at the world and say, gee, I have this dictionary, and by the way, I build my own dictionary, because guess what I did? I took Wikipedia, and I boiled it down, and I counted the world, and I kept all the ones that were frequent enough, and now I've got my own dictionary of good English or good whatever. And the world is not in my dictionary, but gee, it's like one letter away from it, from one of the worlds. Ha! You know, there goes your spell checker. So there's a whole science of that. Then you get into finding synonyms. That's different. This is not about what the text looks like, it's what it means, which brings the fancy world semantic. Right? Semantic means meaning. So what does the world mean? And which world means similar things? And similar in what sense? So is San Francisco is similar to Tiburon. Well, they sort of live next to each other geographically, but they sort of a different one. It's big, one is small, so I don't know, depends what you mean by similar. You know, is a raccoon similar to a dog? Well, yeah, things like that, right? But similar. So this is, but, you know, synonyms would be the extreme form of this, where you can say, I can, I can interchangeably use this word for that one. That's actually quite rare. It would be interchangeable. Power speech tagging, you look at a sentence and you say, where is the subject? Where is the verb? What is that you know, adjective attached to? You know, which noun is it related to? So the whole you know, grammatical analysis, which can be important to. So people have developed code to do that. Then you have, and this is probably, if you ever work on text, it's most likely going to be on this, right, statistically, it's classification. Right. So you take a bunch of documents, it can be single words, they can be as short as you know, a tweet, or the title of a, you know, something for sale on eBay, or they can be entire news stories or books. And then the question is, what is it about? I'm going to classify it in some, in some way. So usually you need to do this first. Right? You, need to, well, you need to decide if you can read it. So this is the whole encoding issue. I don't know if that tells you anything. Probably have studied that. Unicode versus other legacy encodings for text. So you need to know about this, otherwise you just can't read the text itself. Then you need to detect the language. 
if it's in Portuguese and you're trying to parse it with an English you know, dictionary, it's not going to go well. And I, don't remember, I remember not so long ago, Twitter didn't do that. They would have to be 30 pages in language you don't speak <laughs> in response to a query in English, just because the world happened to do that. Um, so language detection. Sentiment analysis, big thing. It's only classification. Right? Is that review of you know, whatever, this product, or this opinion about somebody, positive, negative, neutral. Big deal. I mean, entire you know, marketing and political you know, world is basically based on that. Right? People are trading massive amount of money in Wall Street based on you know, the sentiment about this company has gone from you know, slightly positive to slightly negative. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, my point is, this is not a bunch of academics that in fun and publishing papers. There's massive fortune being made on stuff like this, right? So, sentiment analysis is a big one. Spam detection. Is that email for real, or is it just trying to, you know, trick me into clicking on a link, or, you know, somehow getting to my, my wallet? Uh, matching up to content. I spent two years on a company that was in that business. I mean, massive, massive, you know, economical impact of those things. Um, and it's simply, essentially, a classification. Right. So the people who want to buy advertising are interested, and you know, then you have 200 categories, and the pages on which we're putting ads have this text. So which ad should I put on that page? Well, let's see. That page is mostly about, you know, golf. Okay, who wants to buy ads about golf? And now you've got basically five milliseconds to do that. That's the ad world. Okay, so that's that's the thing. So again. NLP throughout, very important stuff. Okay, then you get into more semantic stuff. You know, you have a bunch of text and you want to extract the sort of important things. So the people, you know, imagine new stories. Who is this about? Where is this taking place? Uh, so you can find entities. Entities just mean typically people, places, text. But uh, um, For text search, now from Google, with Grandpa Alta Vista behind it. Right? So, uh, the, you know, the ability to take all the text on the web, make it searchable, and get you better and better answers. Now, Google is evolving away from I mean, less of this and much more of deep learning, but that's recent. Google, until a year or two ago, was using the kind of techniques you know, we're going to describe to you, not deep learning. That's very recent. So, it's pretty powerful to do that. Summarization, really tough problem. Here's a long story, and I want two paragraphs. So if it's simply decide which three sentences you should keep, it's relatively easy. If it's generate text from scratch that describes what's going on, it's hellish. <laughs> and basically, nobody does a good job to be still in yourself one. Okay? So uh, automated translation has made a massive amount of progress. Massive. If I mentioned this, but I took my own way back in 1997. Some dude launched something called Babelfish. That was me. <laughs> so, you know, and that was, I mean, pitiful compared to today, because people thought it was a meal. Because they could take a Chinese newspaper, and of course they didn't speak Chinese, plug it in that, and after a minute they would, oh, this is talking about blah, blah, blah. Oh my god. Right, so we've gone a very long way uh, in, in, you know, not so many years. Question answering, this is a you know, subject of the future. A lot of people working on this, including that dude, that dude over there. Um, you know, here's a bunch of text, and then I want to come and ask a question and get an answer. You know, where is a whole, bunch, a whole button school located? How many students does it have? Do they teach deep learning? And just get an answer to many people that somebody having to have pre-coded all the answers, right? So that's question answering. And then we get into the fancy stuff, right? Visual assistant, uh, virtual assistant, sorry. Um, and then the virtual assistant of the future. And people are working really hard on this. So this is natural language processing. So I'll start, so this is the point where you learn stuff that you probably don't know, okay? So how do you represent text? Well, you can be worried about representing worlds, okay? How do you represent worlds? How do you code your worlds so you can give it to a system to do something with? So I'll give you four different ways. One is, it's a string. It's just a sequence of characters. And if you remember when Greg you know, was doing the exercise about the teaching addition, 
you know, the, the machine that learned how to do additions. The, the starting point was just text. It was not numbers represented as numbers. It was just numbers represented as text in one character at a time. So you can represent text as, as just a sequence of characters. Um, serious people have thought for a very long time that that was a bad idea. I mean, it's just too low level. Obviously, you have to be at the level of worlds and entities and you know, higher level stuff. And it turns out, very recent thing, you can actually do amazing things just by working at the character level. So I'll show you some examples uh, later. Okay, second option, and I'm talking deep learning kind of stuff. Otherwise, the only NLP that really works at this level would be like spell checking or finding the root of a, you know, a, a, like a verb or something like that. Uh, <coughs> usually work with, with entire words. Okay, the second thing is you can just create a dictionary, you list your, 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 your words, you give them a number, one, two, three, four, five, and you tell your all run, well, we're currently on world you know, 4048, which means nothing. Now, if you feed that to a deep learning network, it's going to have the impression that 4048 is pretty close to 4049, because it's used to numbers that sort of activate things, and it's going to believe in some sort of continuity, which is completely wrong, right? I mean, it, it, it's not true. Those, those two worlds that just happen to be in the list, and who knows how you solve it, but that's not going to work. So this is usually a pretty bad idea. Here's a better version of this idea, and Greg has already shown you that. Again, the example of the addition, where you, know, you start from this, but you kind of, what you do is, assuming you have a reasonably large vocabulary, a reasonably small vocabulary, not too large, what you do is, you take, so let's say you have a thousand different worlds in your vocabulary. You're going to generate a vector which has a thousand positions. You're going to set all of them to zero, except one to one. So that's called a, hot, a, a one hot vector. So now what's happening, and now you've got this you know, thousand numbers that you're going to push into your neural network. And the neural network will not assume that the one in this position is, is related to one in that position. It's just a different thing, because they will have one neuron each to worry about. Okay, so it's a it's a small encoding of a, of a dumb representation. <laughs> but it's a small encoding that works as long as you don't have a huge vocabulary. If you work at the level of characters, this works beautifully because you have to worry about what, you know, 26 to 100 different characters, depending if you care about the case set and punctuation. But if you try to do this on, let's say, worlds, then you shouldn't go to a million, right? And just to give you an order of magnitude, because I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, um, everyday English, if you don't try to be too technical, is probably in the low tens of hundreds of worlds, right, depending, you know, maybe people get along. I mean, I think, you know, people really poor vocabulary might get away with maybe 2,000 to 5,000 worlds. Uh, as soon as you want to be able to talk to, in a specific domain, you can come back in medicine, and, driving a car and so on, you're probably in the 100,000. If you want to represent a lot of things, like being able to understand everything on Wikipedia, you've passed a million. You're probably in several million. So that just gives you an idea of you know, how big a vocabulary has to be for things to, to work. Right? So you couldn't have a vector of size several million in this kind of representation. That would not be a good idea. I mean, because your, your network would have to be size of million, and then whatever that happens. Okay. So those are three representations, and I'm going to talk about another one, and that's the magic, distributed representations. Oh, sorry, I thought we were here. Distributed representations. So let me use an analogy, okay? Let's imagine that instead of, you know, I have an animal in mind, and instead of, let's start this, instead of giving you the string or some idea that means nothing, you know, just as much as the the little stickers on the fruit of the supermarket, that's where that picture came from. Uh, you know, all this, so none of those. You want a representation where you can sort of guess enough properties about the animal. Right. Why? Because you represent it by a bunch of properties. So here it is. Mammal, striped tail, hand like front paws, washing his food, facial mask, not a fruit, omnivorous. What is it? It's a raccoon. <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, or it could be a few other things. Maybe there are, you know, maybe an otter, no, 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 well, probably a raccoon or something close to a raccoon. Okay, so I described this animal with a bunch of properties, right? 
it's not as precise as calling a raccoon and having the Wikipedia page with a picture and, you know, okay. But it's described by a bunch of properties. Now imagine that I have a bunch of properties like this. I don't know, a few hundred. And I try to describe a lot of animals this way. Then I could compare. I said, imagine I have raccoon here and cat here and, you know, whatever, fish here, some fish. I could compare sort of the one line at a time and say, same, similar, totally different, totally different, similar, similar, and have some sort of metric that tells me how close they are. Right. So I would have a, I guess here, a semantic distance, something that tells me how different they are in meaning. And that is an amazingly strong property. That's something you really want when you create a text. Right. So having a representation like this would allow me to take different worlds and compare them and say they're pretty close or they're near identical or they're really they're not <coughs> with each other. Right. So if it was, you know, the one for raccoon and the one for another one, you know, a piece of rock, that would be nothing in common between the two except maybe you know both have mass or something like that. But that's about it. Okay? So okay, so this is called the distributed representation. Why? Because you, you try to spread it across all those different dimensions all those different properties, which are sort of, you know, in this case they're precise. And this is where it gets interesting. So, people have been working on this for a while, but the magic happened about three, four years ago. So, this representation is this whole idea, but three, four years ago people came up with this thing called word embeddings or word vectors. And we gave you a lot of flavor of this in the first, first uh, class, but I'll take you through that. It's something that has this kind of property. Right, so let's say you have the world for cat. And you sort of measure the distance, and so in your mind you want to, you know, wait, what's the wrong cat? Right, you want to ask that question. What are the ones that are close to cat? And you want worlds like this to be close to cat, and you know, Perrain is certainly closer than dog, because a dog is a animal, it's a, you know, domestic animal and so on, but, but it doesn't purr, and it doesn't chase by. So, okay, you know, no further. Lion, yeah, well, you know, it's in the same family, it's a big cat, okay. So you want this sort of distance, and then you have yeah, everything else, <laughs> not related to cat. Right? None of this has much to do with cat, maybe so far. <laughs> so, so you want this public right, of those far away. So how do you achieve that? So this is the magic. Um, so in 2013, I think it was in the late 2012, early 2013, and there were two papers actually, so that's why people take either one or the other. This dude, pretty small guy, used to work at Google, now he's on Facebook, uh, in a research group. And he came up with this algorithm, and something I'll show you in a minute, uh, called work to work And the idea is very simple, but I'll take you through that in a moment. Um, but the very, very high level stuff is, start from a lot of text. So let's say you have the whole content of Wikipedia and some other stuff like that. Okay, so a lot of text about everything. Everything. Then you pick a dimension. It's the guess a number game. Okay. How big should it be? Well, let's see. Two is too small and 10,000 is too big. Okay, how big should it be? Right. So you pick a dimension for your vectors. So this is the equivalent of the number when we had the, you know, it's an animal and it's got claws and so on. Well, you pick how many you want of those. So, you know, by default you say 200 and it's a good answer, okay? And now it will generate a set of vectors. But the question is, vectors of what? And the answer is, being a neural network that you're interested in, it's going to generate a set of, a vector of numbers that mean absolutely nothing. All right, so let's, let's this thing here. It will come up with a vector for each world so we'll take a bunch of text, Wikipedia. We put Wikipedia through some sort of meat grinder, and what comes out is, for all your worlds in the European European Bureau, a long vector of the dimension you chose, so let's say 200 here, of abstract numbers that mean nothing. Yes? What do those numbers mean? Nothing. <laughs> How big is the vector? 200. <laughs> okay, can you take a crystal ball to generate it? Sorry. <laughs> okay, so now, the crazy part is the following. 
if you use a sort of <coughs> computer distance by doing pretty much what I said before, right? You sort of compare those numbers and add the differences and you know that tells you how far apart they are. You end up that's called the cosine distance because it's actually the generalization of the angle between two vectors. And you end up with something like this. Things that are close in meaning, once you do the math on those <coughs> silly vectors made of numbers that mean nothing, will be pretty close. They have a small distance between. And the ones that have nothing in common will have a large distance. So, I'm sure you are already lost. Do you guys want to find seats? No, okay. No, you're not. And enjoy standing. Good. <laughs> so, I understand this is the kind of stuff that people have been looking for for a very long time. It's a representation of text where you get this semantic distance, and in this case you get it very cheaply. So let me explain to you what you can do with this. Okay? I'll take a few examples. I literally wrote the code on my laptop for fun. It's still running right here, so if you don't believe me, I'll show you. <laughs> and type a world, and it lists me all the worlds that are around it in sort of order of distance. Which ones are the closest? Champagne, French champagne, cognac, champagne, champagne, Berkeley, Coca-Cola, okay. From here to here, and maybe you know that, it has to do with fancy wine. Okay? Preferably champagne. Like, or expensive, or French, or, but you get the idea. They're related in that sense. There is, I mean, I don't think I've seen a single mistake. I usually put that in red if I see that. So, you know, it's all wine related and fancy wine related. And you say, how could this be? Where did you get this wine knowledge? How did you put this one knowledge in there? And the answer is, I didn't. I swear, nothing. This thing just took a bunch of you know, text from Wikipedia, a bunch of text from, uh, I put some web stuff in there as well, web pages. And then it sort of analyzed the association between all the worlds and came up with this. <laughs> mistake if there is one. Okay, yes, I found a mistake. I put it in you know, new movie. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Shoot me now. <laughs> right. So it's, again, it's amazing. And you can tell that, you know, I mean, you don't find like a 1940 actor here. It's a modern, they're well known. They, they've, you know, they sort of are in the same movies. And I'm sure that if you find, you know, a, a 1940, you know, Western movie guy, it would be at the bottom, you know, way further, right? So clearly, this code also got the concept of, you know, famous actors. Yeah. What is the dimension yeah. of your vector? I think it goes up to 100 or something like that. But because uh, uh, I have a whole set of them, so I couldn't tell you which one I use at that point. But it's it's a few hundred, usually two two hundred. Okay. Yeah. So two hundred for, for the response or two hundred uh, oh, for sorry. trading the. Uh -huh. I don't know. The response would be like a million because you could take the entire vocabulary, right? So I just I just took whatever fit on the on the slide. Okay. <coughs> and, and this goes on. Yeah. So the initial vectors is it just looking at proximity? Uh, so in other words, it's looking to see mm -hmm. how close Brad Pitt was to Mark Wahlberg in different yes. blocks of text. I mean, literally, you know, it's, it's a teeny bit smaller than this, but not much. Let's say you have a million words in your vocabulary, which I think is what I have. And you take Brad Pitt, and you compare to all the other ones, and you say, okay, who's close to Brad Pitt? And when you measure the distance, and you keep the top ones, and the closest one would be actually measured, then the next one would be George Clooney, and so on. So this is what has displayed. So you visualize those points, you know, those vectors being like points in space, you zoom on Brad Pitt, and you sort of 
look for the near stars. <laughs> but did you change the, the, the base from the previous example, or is it the same base? It's the exact same. All the examples I'm going to show you are the exact same of set of vectors. The same. So imagine this, and it's hard to do. It's actually impossible. You have a million points in a space of dimension 200. Nobody in this planet can wrap their head around what that means, right? So you can see two, and you can see three dimensions, but then you can't go further. But basically, there's a lot of space in a space of 200 dimensions. So things can be closed in different ways. That's all the trick. I could actually go afternoon on this because I really tried to understand that, and it's, you can't. Right? <laughs> you have to, one of those things that you have to sort of believe. So, but there's no change, so nothing was injected to say, you know, we're talking about actors here, nothing was changed from one to the other, there was no training that was done for one rather than the other. No questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, because Brad Pitt has a vastly different semantic meaning to me. Why did the algorithm pick out a bunch of actors instead of his movies or the characters he played? Okay. Because, I mean, I'm sure if we go far enough, we'll find movies. Um, because, because of the, you know, the notion of similarity. Right. So similarity in that case means um, very loosely. Out of all the text, and this thing ate a lot of text, like gigabytes, <coughs> out of all the text in which Brad Pitt appears, well, Angelina Jolie appears in similar sentences, in similar text. It's got a sort of similar world with similar meaning around, around it. So it's more interchangeable, but not exactly, okay? So, so that's why, you know, it's mostly actors first. But then you would find, you know, the movie you mentioned somewhere there, so it would be there, just not as much. So that's why it would be further down. Okay, let's try the next one. This one, for me. Greenish, okay? But it's not just colors, it's vague colors. Everything. Grayish green, pale blue, purple spots, okay, fine. <laughs> Chocolate brown, dark brown, it's all, you know, you don't have like a red. Maybe there is, but I haven't seen many. It's all those in between half colors. Green patches. Hmm? Green patches. Isn't green patches, okay, so you find a few, but you, you, well, you know, I could say, you know, anyway. You get the idea, right? Most of it is ish kind of colors. Again. We didn't teach this thing. It just happened that all those colors sort of congregated in the same corner of that ginormous space, which is insane on their own, right? Just because they went through that little piece of code. Okay. There was one, wait, I used that. What was it? Say nothing. Say nothing. Yeah. Say nothing. Okay. Yeah. 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 Really bad choice to say nothing. Okay, here's my favorite, and that's why I highlighted it. Yeah. <laughs> say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible to say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, okay. Next. So this one, I tried to find a world that really would be sort of, you know, super precise meaning, very. Well, so everybody knows because I didn't until recently what confabulation means. Right. Here's my test for do you know what this word means? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well maybe if you read this <laughs> but it's it's making up stories, right? So you know, little kids make up stories and <clears throat> some grown ups on TV also make up stories and actually it depends. <laughs> so <laughs> so what's interesting is you know, as I try this and I looked at that and it's all about that sort of the where is it? False memories, illusion, amnesia, cabra. So I checked because I don't know that world. That's in Poppenhorn. It's the name of the sin of the syndrome. So it's a medical condition where people think that somebody around them, like their spouse or kid or dog, was replaced by an imposter. <laughs> so it's somebody that looks just like their wife. It's not their wife. They knew it. They just know. Okay. So it's very strange and it has to do with. You tell yourself a story and you really, really believe it. Right, so that's weird. But it's right there, it's not very far. That's a bias, and <coughs> so this can be causes for all this kind of stuff, hallucination, 
Okay, here comes somebody. Who's she? Well, she's a very famous researcher about human memory and all these cases of you know imp implanted memories and you know repressed memories and so on. And she brought in a bunch of cases to know if you know the person was really crazy or not. So that's why she's there. Right. And it keeps going on, you know, more and more things about the brain and memories and making up stuff and you know, yeah. Um, you have some. Uh Associations of world, like two worlds or three worlds. How does it work? Like in entrance, you have a vector for each world or for association. Um, you, like, do you have an input? Do you have a vector for I? Do you have uh, in the inputs an, a vector for autobiographical memory, or yes. do you have a vector for each one? No, no. I, I created. I, when I create this this book in memory, I. I, I had a mix of single worlds and worlds were made of multiple worlds. Uh, basically. Like so I, I created a vocabulary of those interesting things. It's like how many were your works, for instance? Yep. 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 Okay. Yep. That kind of stuff. So then I would miss New York. But then what's interesting is when you do that, you get exactly interesting little phrases which are not really the name of something, but they could be. Yeah. Right? Okay. So for the next one. So world two vec, I found that I was telling you, and world embeddings are famous for this property, which is so crazy. And when that came out, people were just floored again. So this is the fact that, yeah, here's the place where, here's the vector for king, and let's imagine that instead of 200 dimensions, it's two dimensions. And actually there are programs that do that, that find the best two dimensions and project it, and you can actually visualize. So you have king and queen. And they're sort of in that position with this vector that takes you from one to the other. And then you look at man and woman, and son and daughter, and nephew and niece, and boy and girl, and I, you know, I painted them all funny, but basically, they sort of are the same. So that means that there's a vector that takes you from male to female. Now, is that insane or what? It's the same vector. So not only did they, you know, the reddish organized with the other vague colors and the famous actor congregated on Brad, Brad Pitt, but somehow, all the boys and all the girls made sure to be exactly at the same distance from each other. All right. That's reasonably insane. Okay. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> so, this is a game that people have played, which is, you read like this. Paris is to France as London is to England. So the game is, and I've coded this on the whole thing too, you type those three worlds, and it has to guess the fourth one. So it has to find, you know, return the nearest one. And sometimes it's not the absolute nearest, but it's, you know, very close. And so those are the kind of thing you find. Right. So this is about capital. This is about, you know, baby animal. This is about drama. Well, not, not so much drama, but, you know, person doing the action and the action. And those Microsoft, who did which part? <laughs> um, symbol for an element. <laughs> Favorite food. <laughs> there are hundreds of those. And they are across both semantic, meaning meanings of things. You know, you find like company and the name of the CEO. You find the name of the city and the zip code. I mean, things like that. It's reasonably insane. Right? So those are meanings. And then you find grammar stuff. So, yes, trolls. <coughs> uh, what do we call that? Geonative. Uh, past tense, uh, adjective to adverb, um, you know, opposite. So again, those dumb things organize themselves somehow so that, you know, all the adjectives are here and all the adverbs derived from the adjectives are in the same direction from those, which is crazy. Now, I found this recently and this was too funny. So those associations, are really influenced by the corpus that you read, by all the text you read. The algorithm has no bias. But you find some biases that are in the corpus. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you say men is to doctors, women is to? Yes. <laughs> Kill me now. <laughs> but yes, that's basically you know, how it works. And then you do it again, so you can try it. instead of what? Yep, it works. Uh, this one was interesting because maybe. Really, uh, <laughs> um, okay, this one, I don't know what to make with. You know? <laughs> and this one is also interesting. 
Okay, so, and you could go on like this for days. I mean, just, just playing with this kind of, a, of association. So that means that this, you know, this space of a million vectors representing all sort of worlds, some you know, of things, some of worlds, and so on, they organize themselves in this incredibly complicated way where you can find structure. Not only do they have this proximity, but they have this crazy sort of, you know, constant relation where you can literally say, here's the vector that represents, you know, going from men to women or from, you know, adjective to other. Yes? What is the size of, of your space? It's all, all way, oh. And it's always uh, 200 or it's more? Yeah, yeah, it's the same set of vector I've been using the whole time. Okay. Uh, so, you know, a few hundreds. I mean, the normal range, just, you know, for sort of normal application would be maybe 50 at the low end and thousand or two thousand on the high end. And how, I'll, show, I'll show you a crazy example at the end was you know Google used eight thousand, but you know it's in that range. How did you choose them? There is a uh... <laughs> 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 I mean basically the more dimensions the more expensive is going to be to run things and the more precise because you have more dimensions to you know express distance and difference. Yeah not, not the size of the space but uh, what kind of uh, of um, of word how do you choose the, the word so that there'd be enough uh, so 20, years, 20 years of experience with NLP and you know how to choose the world, basically. <laughs> so I build a vocabulary from um, from Wikipedia and from my corpus. So it's you know based on frequency and I need to know how to keep you know certain pairs of worlds which have certain properties and, and so on. But it's not, it's not super hard. You've done it once, you know how to do it. Um, okay, so we've we've seen that. Now this one is one order magnitude more crazy. Imagine you build this vector space for English, and then using a similar corpus, right, let's say Wikipedia, you do it in Spanish. Guess what? They're positioned the same. So basically, aside from some rotation, because that's not literally, right, uh, there's sort of no up and down in that space, so it's okay to rotate. But basically, they are in the same position. Right? So if, you know, three, four, five, or three, five, four, in this order, then, you know, Transport Prozinko are in the same order relative to each other. Which means crazy things such as you could imagine a language where, you know, you don't know what this means, but you know what those mean, so you can sort of find the place, find the neighborhood, and figure out something about what's there. Right? So if this was some strange animal that you don't know how, you don't know the translation. You could figure it out just from the meaning, or at least even if you don't know the exact meaning, you would say, well, I can use that because I know the neighbors. So they can help me with me. Okay? So this works with across languages. Now, my theory is if we had a you know Martian Wikipedia describing life on Mars, it would not work because it would describe a different world, a different concept, and different relation between things. Right? We don't have the concept of, you know, the Martian winter is coming, let's move to the North Pole. We don't have that on Earth, so we don't worry about it. So there would be no equivalence, the text would be different. Uh, or, you know, let's hide from those stupid probes the Earth people keep sending us. So, uh, <laughs> so, but other than that, uh, you know, the fact that it works across languages is a little crazy. Because not only do things have organized, but it seems to be sturdy. A similar corpus will give you a similar set of vectors positioned the same way in a different language. Okay. No, you're not going to believe me. Paper? I'm easy to read. Let me simply show this. If you have images and some text, and let's simplify. Let's say that you have caption for the image, okay? And you say, add this image, and then somehow, just trust me, that would be a little complicated, but somehow I'm going to subtract day and at night, images like this come out. So famous landmark at night rather than by day. And you know, you say this, but the same thing that doesn't fly but actually sails, a bunch of boats and so on. So, yeah, this one is a little off, a little too much. <laughs> but people have, you know, are playing with this. Uh, there's this thing called zero sort of short learning, um, which I won't even try to explain. But it's it's one of that. But you could literally like use worlds to guess images or use images to guess worlds. It's reasonably crazy. But I won't spend too much time on this one because I will take the afternoon. Now. Why am I so excited about vectors? And why, when do you use vectors? What can they do for you? So here's the thing. Imagine you're building a classifier. And it's a super simple classifier here. I'm going to give you worlds. Or maybe it's a piece of text and you look at the worlds inside and you try to guess. Yeah. 
and in the whole thing, am I talking about an animal, a vegetal, you know, or a mineral? Okay, and this is your training set. So I have a set of animals, and a set of you know, whatever, like plants, and a set of minerals. And then the question is raccoon. I love raccoons, I have in my backyard. So. <laughs> okay, so the question is raccoons. If you don't like the kind of thing I'm talking about, well, you take raccoon, you go through there, and you say, nope, it's not there. I know nothing. Done. Totally failed. Right? It's not in the training set. There's nothing I can do. And I imagine that you have world vector representation for us. Right? So you have those crazy vectors. <coughs> so now what you can do is you take my code and you say, okay, I don't know you, but let me compare you to those guys in terms of distance. And I did it. Okay, I took literally these worlds and I did it. And so you find that, you know, raccoon is about 67% close to bobcat, squirrel, coyote, restroom skunk, possum, and so on. But then if you compare it to grass or sand, it's really far away. So conclusion, it's probably an animal. Why? Because even though I had zero knowledge about this raccoon, I have never seen that world before. It happens to be in my, in my work vector, vector space, but in that, you know, it's not in this model. I can still use it, and I can still learn something about it. So this is the thing where you know you do, you have text and you want to classify it, you want to analyze it somehow, and you only have a training set that big. And about five years ago, people would have said, "Well, we need to find ways to increase the training set as much as we can because if we hit worlds that we have never seen, most that looks good. It's nothing we can do." And with using vectors, it's no longer true. You get this sort of fuzziness. As long as you have worlds that have similar meaning that you know something about. Right, so imagine you do um, sentiment analysis. And let's say that you, you know, people use terms you've never seen. Right. So I'm fancy you of saying, you know, awesome, that you don't have ever seen in your training set. Well, you take the vector and you say, what's around it? And you find awesome, great, amazing, and you say, okay, hands up, you know, thumbs up. So, that's why vectors are exciting. It's one of the reasons why they're exciting. The other thing is, a vector is just a bunch of numbers. Normally we look at images, and images, once you push them through those networks, the convolutional neural networks, at the end you just have all those activations, so it's just a bunch of numbers. It's a vector. It's the same thing. And so you can happily mix text and images, and people do you know, things like that to do like caption from images or videos. By, by, by mi mixing the two. So, um, anyway, so that's why you know, vectors for worlds are, are really powerful. Everybody knows that you feel you're learning a little bit. Yeah, sorry, can you explain again how can you fix the coefficient of the vector for raccoon if you have never seen a raccoon before? No, no, it has to be in your vocabulary, but that's the thing you build from Wikipedia. Okay. And you can easily have a million terms in there, no problem, right? So you do that once, you've covered just about everything anybody would ever use. Yeah. But then when you build your training set, you know, somehow somebody had to sit down and say, you know, that's an animal, that's a vegetal, that's okay. So that is expensive. That takes time. It cannot be huge. Right? It's hard to cover all vocabulary with that. Right? There'll be some you know name of a beetle that you know only lives in a cave in Africa that you don't know about and, but it's in Wikipedia. So it will have its own vector and it will, you know, be positioned in the right place. So yes, it has to be in the vector space, but that is easy to make very big. And then your training set only touches a teeny chunk of the vector space. But then the fuzziness due to the distance, right? The things around those points is going to cover pretty much everything. That's the magic. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Yeah. 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 Are the topics like animal, vegetable, or minimal mineral represented as graded vector subspaces? Because you could have a concept, you know, I don't know, anything blue. Or you could, I mean, you could have you know, funny categories that are not like, I mean, if your categories were like, you know, all colors, and yeah, probably all country, and yeah, they're probably sort of in the same corner, but you could have a concept that's, you know, much more complicated, right? So your training set could not be like one big bulb somewhere, but a bunch of things, um, but you probably would still have this. You know, proximity that would that would pay off, right? Because things that are close have a lot of properties in common with that with that world. You could find kind of examples, right? And 
I was just about to tell you that, you know, if I say, you know, everything blue, well, maybe not a strong enough property, right, that, you know, the neighborhood of everything, any blue thing is not another blue thing, so that, that would fare in cases like this. All right. Where do you get vectors? How do you get vectors? Two ways. You steal them and make them. <laughs> so you steal them is the easy way, and that's the encouraged way. You can download a bunch of vectors of Google, and we'll uh, put this in the right documents if you want. We, you know, it's easy to find. You, you, you Google work to vec, you can't miss it. But in case you miss it, ask us, and if we forget to send them to you. Google provides a bunch of vector sets that are really nice. Okay, so it's easy. You download one, and you start using it. Uh, there's something called Grub, which is from sort of the, the world to vec, but from Stanford instead of being from Google, and it's similar, and they also publish vector sets, and of course, they say they're better, and of course they say they're better. Uh, <coughs> there's a site, where you found this, that has a lot of vectors in a lot of different languages, which is really cool, because then you can do all sorts of interesting stuff in, in languages you can speak. Um, so that's option number one. Option number two, rub your sleeves, so you start, this is what I do, okay? So you download a big corpus. So typically, Wikipedia, you can use web pages. There's something more common crawl that has a huge, it's basically a crawl of the web sitting on, on AWS waiting for you to use it, and it's kept up to date. So you don't have to crawl the web yourself. Somebody did it for you. And then you can get you know, news sites that you can sort of crawl and so on. Lots of text. What you want is clean text, meaning mm. text that means something. If it's gibberish, your vectors are going to be gibberish. So you want text that actually means something, and a lot of it, and about as much as possible. About as many topics as possible. So that's what that means. Then you have to do a vocabulary, and that was your question. So, you know, you can pick simple words, you can pick phrases like New York, or, you know, things that have multiple worlds. Or often the code will just say, you know, I'll keep the most common world, the most frequent world in the, in the corpus. You have a choice. And you pick a size, and then you run, so you have a choice. You can run work to vec, that's a nice piece of C that actually works really fast and easily, but it's, you know, it's, you have to do it yourself. Or there is uh, a library that Greg is going to show which has a really fast implementation of work to vec, and that's extremely easy to do. And then if you really like pain, you can try more academic packages and don't. But, <coughs> yeah, but you would get good results as well. So those are the two options, and obviously that's the simplest, and that's the next simplest, and then no pain, and no work. So unless you have super special needs, there's no need to do it. So that is another hard to get. Okay, so those sort of the first half. I'm getting hot, so I'm gonna rub my sleeves. Questions about that part, about the sort of, you know, crazy representation for text that four years ago people had no clue about. And now it's like, just discovering how powerful that stuff is. So if you can, uh, sorry, if you can uh, create a vector out of two or three words, uh, is there? Because you had a few of them up there, right? Is, is there any limit to the size you can get? Could you make a vector out of a sentence or an article? I guess busy. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was about to look at you with a big smile and expect a big smile in return. But it is. <laughs> the gentleman was asking if we could create vectors that are like a sentence. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes. I mean that's that's a very active area of research. So um, so yes, you can. I mean it, it's two different things, right? If if you take a word like New York and you say, you know, I don't want to take like the word for New York, the word for York, because it's somehow magically it's going to be New York. It doesn't work. Um, so what I did is that, is to say New York is a world, and every time I find it, I treat it like a world. Um, I literally go through the corpus and you place the space in between with an underscore. That's literally what I do. The rest of the code works by itself. I just remove the underscore and I display. So, um, so we're not thinking about this. We're thinking about here's a sentence, and each you know, of the worlds have meanings. And can you do something that looks like a vector? The answer is yes. People have tried that, and it seems to work. Right. So, I mean, not if it's an entire book, but for things that are reasonably short, yes. So you can get, and then there is a, you know, people at Google call this a thought vector. And uh, I'll show you, just hold on, I want to show you the last thing, uh, uh, which is a, a translation machine. Uh, 
it uses exactly that. So you can take a piece of text and crunch, 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 and create one vector that captures enough of the meaning that if you had two different ways of saying the same thing, they would probably be very close vectors. So people have done that. There's something called, in fact, if you look at, yeah, I guess, uh, right? Doc2vec is in the same way. Yeah. So there's something called Doc2vec instead of Doc2vec that does that. So, so yeah. You say it's only for four years old, but what is only for four years old? The, oh, the, fact the, the idea of vectors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This represented and specifically the, the piece of code that made it possible, which is the, the word to back. So, so before it was only uh, uh, strings? Uh. No, people were doing something very, very heavy. So you couldn't do it at scale. You couldn't have done it in a million worlds and you know, all of Wikipedia. It would have taken a month, literally. I mean, the first attempt were much less powerful in terms of results and it would literally take months of, of computation. So somebody had to sort of crack the code and that guy did. The Google guy? Okay. The Google guy. So, how do you avoid? So, if you're running this on Wikipedia, mm -hmm. the word A and the, mm -hmm. and if I'm imagining these vectors, I'm imagining a list of 200 correlation coefficients from biggest to smallest, yeah. uh, wouldn't those be at the very top? There's no top in the vector. There'd be top in the frequency. Top in the frequency, okay. But there wouldn't be, there's no top in the vector. So they're, they're, those words have an interesting property. They're basically close to everything. Which in two or three dimensions doesn't mean anything, but in 200 dimension actually is possible. So they're very close to a lot of things. Because they appear to everything, and so they some sort of medium distance from everything, which is bad. So you TP in all those worlds. They don't really carry a strong meaning. So you're manually excluding them in some way? So if you were doing something like what you asked for, you know, like a document to a vector kind of thing, I mean, the right process would be you take the text, you first recognize the phrase. So if there's New York, you don't treat separately New and New York, you would treat New York as one thing, you that vector. And then any quote stop word, that's what they're called. Right? It's a word that is so common. You know, there are words that when you type in the Google, Text box, uh, search box, they basically don't matter. I mean, they're all thrown away first thing. Um, so, those kind of words, you know, the, the, the super common words exactly like those. The, a, of, you know, is, you know, those things, they just, they're everywhere, so they, they just don't carry enough meaning. So, those are just, you know, just us. And it's just by frequency. Literally, if you do Wikipedia, I count all the worlds, solve that by frequency, I tell you, the, of, <laughs> You know, you take the top, whatever, chop that, and say, you know, in all those worlds, and you do yourself in the Okay, that's the text, the fancy text representation. Now, I just wanted to close that, that little chapter. I want to emphasize that, you know, that's the new and exciting stuff in, in, in text. But <coughs> the stuff that Greg is going to talk about and, and, and show you, which is more classic, which is before vectors, has given us, you know, Google and Siri and things like that, right? So it is powerful too. You don't have to use vectors, but when you do for some problem, good thing time. Right? So it gives you further. Like the ability to do you know, a really good sentiment analysis engine without it being a general training set. Right? This you can do with vectors and it's harder to do with the, the other classical techniques. All right, ready for the second part, which is, and actually I think it's actually shorter. Um, so, the same way that images had the convolutional neural network, special topology for images, the text has its own little family of favorite uh, networks. They call recurrent neural network. And I think I touched on that last time, maybe, or two, two classes ago. So the idea is you have something, and this is your little normal neuron, except it has two inputs. One input, and then the output is actually its previous output. Right. So it takes its output and sort of pushes it back in the, for the next input, for the next time. Right. And so this thing will go clone this, zip, <laughs> is, zip, not, mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, so that's what they call the current neural network. <coughs> they take the text and they compute something by doing sort of one, one word at a time or one character at a time. The reason why it's good for text is because those things can actually treat sequences. 
right? Because if you run the, the network will look that for images, they're a fixed size. You only get so many, you know, the array was only a certain size. And text tends to be variable size. So things that can deal with an arbitrary length sequence are good. And typically there's like a magic thing at the end that says, you know, end of sentence. And then that's when things happen. Now, this is what really happens, and it's often represented like this, and so people think that recurrent neural network have all those boxes, you know, computing like this, but no, it's, this is really a representation in time. Right? First step, you push this world, then you put the next one, and so on and so on. Does that make sense? Right. So it's, remember how we saw a lot of networks that were like, there was layer one, layer two, layer three? This is a little bit like a multi, you know, infinite number of layers, except it's the same piece of code that is just calling repeatedly by reusing what it just computed and fed back. Okay, so those are the normal recurring neural network in general. And they have, yes, those are an issue. So let me try to abstract a little bit. So when you feed text, what you want to do is to learn some pattern from the text. Right? You know, try to pick up something. It depends what it is you're training it against. But you know, just like you train your dog to fetch your newspaper or you know chase book of robbers, it depends what you reward it for. You know, here you it depends what you train it for. But basically, you feed a long sequence of words or characters, and you try to train it to do something. The problem is when you look at the math of those network, um, they they forget quickly. Because just of the math is what you know, the, the input here, by the time it's here, has been multiplied by so many things that it's basically that contribution was lost, and only you remember the, the, the recent stuff. Right. This was like a you know, 100 word sentence. The beginning of the sentence wouldn't matter. Anything learned there would be followed by the time you get to the end. So, because the world is populated, at least that world is populated by small people, they came up with a solution. And Greg has already used that term. And we'll define it a little more. So the problem was the short term, but the, the short term memory, right? The, the thing we have just a very short term memory. We just remember the stuff that was done recently, that was given to it recently, and then forget the past. So those are called long short term memory. Because they can really remember things for a very long time. And I'm not going to go into this, but the reason is you have two different variables, and you have, if you want, some sort of a highway that remembers value which can be kept for a long time and then you have input and output. I won't go into the details because you really need to you just need to remember that stuff was designed so that it can treat long sequences and be able to understand patterns over a very long sequence. So I have an example. Um, you guys can go download and play with this. It's really fun. Greg and I took this apart a few months ago just for fun, and it was, that, that was cute. So here's the idea. This is, remember the, the Condon test, the, the red and green example? It's just the same guy who coded that, okay? He's really good. <coughs> you know that little piece of code, here's what it does. It takes a bunch of text, and you, you give it one character at a time. So it's a case where you don't have, uh, you don't have words, you don't have, you know, in the back. you just give it one character at a time, coded the way Greg showed you the one hot. And then you train it to do something very simple. It is to train it the next character. That's all. So based on all the previous characters, it is to train it the next one. Does that remind you of your iPhone, which is trying to predict the next one? OK, it's the next one. Uh, and then, once the training is over, you might just say, OK, V. Just hallucinate, there's no better term, the next character, and the next character, and the next character. And the question is, okay, how good can that get? So the answer is, wow. Okay, so this thing, one example, you gave it all of Shakespeare. Okay? And then it says go. And this thing came up with a totally believable, totally junk piece of Shakespeare. <laughs> I, I, I really love this one. You can read that quickly, you believe it. Right? Yeah, yeah, Shakespeare wrote that. I mean, it has the flavor. It is, you know. Now understand, this thing was not told about words, was not told about punctuation, was not told about you know, how long things should be, wasn't told that you know, 
You should have the name of the person with the column at the end and so on. This was learned from the example. It read a bunch of Shakespeare, about three megabytes, not even that much, and then spit out this. And if you read the, so there's a blog by Carpathy on that, called the unreasonable effectiveness of the current neural network. It's beautiful, it's a classic. It's very entertaining. And it tries on a bunch of things. I just selected two, but I mean, it tried on a bunch of things. So, C code. Yeah, you know, all the salt. <laughs> this thing would have been generic code. And now I don't know. <laughs> so, it literally was fed, I think, you know, like the Unix kernel or something like this. And this thing learned to generate kernel to see that it's all almost compiles. <laughs> right. So, well, I think actually compiles that doesn't, doesn't mean anything. But I mean, this thing picked up comments and, you know, what you put in comments, what kind of words you use in comments, and all the parentheses and indentation and all this. It's insane. And learn all this. Now, Greg and I had fun oh, a few months back. And we tried, we took, uh, let's see, Star Wars characters. So we stole a bunch of Star Wars characters from, um, from Wikipedia. And we fed that to this, and then I used my kids as a test. Yeah. Do you think they could be Star Wars character? Yes. <laughs> so it's a good name. Probably tried it on baby names. Came up with new baby names. So this is a good name than a kid. Uh, so I mean, this thing was just, it's just, it's just funny. And people have tried really funny stuff. You can imagine there is the Donald Trump, you know, uh, speech generator. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's how it's done, okay? That's how those things are done. Um, and uh, let's see. If I remember right, yeah, somebody took all the TED Talks, the transcript from the TED Talks. Then they've taken like, one TED Talk, I was there when it was, I still remember that one. They take the video, remove the thing, and then they have trained all TED Talks, generate this, and have a text-to-speech speak for that person. It's fun. <laughs> I just really tried to find it. I, I, I don't even know right now, but it is, it's just too much, right? So you can do goofy stuff. Now, of course, this is just to show the power of what can be learned. If there is no market really for this, I mean, aside from being elected, you know, uh, in a candidate, but there's no, no, no real market yet for this. But it shows you the power of what, you know, what this thing can learn on its own, just by being exposed to a bunch of text. So, um, Again, Carpathy has this very, you know, he dives into the thing and says, okay, you know, he's got this neural network with a bunch of little neurons. Oh, that's something I forgot to say, but I should, sorry. Okay, when I represent this, I mean, that's one neuron. How small can this be? Right. So, no, 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 no. It's got a bunch of little brothers. So, there's depth as well. So, it's actually, you know, whatever you want 200, 1000. 800,000 know, neurons in parallel taking the same input and then learning something different. So at the end you have a lot of learning taking place. Okay? So it's not as, as dumb as it sounds. And so that's why this thing can pick up a lot of patterns. And so this is an example of, you know, he trained this thing on some text and then said, okay, um, what, what is getting that one you know, so you sort of probe the different neurons and say, what gets you excited? And so here's one that gets excited by text inside quotes. It turns on when you're inside the quote, or whatever. Maybe you know, actually it seems a little off because the guy didn't... Oh, no, sorry, it's blue inside the quote, okay? And then this one seems to get to dig if statements. <laughs> on its own, wasn't programmed to like if statements. One of them just said, I'll do the if statements. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. This one is seems like you know it's more and more excited as the indentation level goes up, and so on. Most of them don't make sense. And maybe they don't make sense and they're useless, or maybe they make sense and we're just not smart enough to figure out where they are. <laughs> okay. Who knows, right? But somehow, you know, hundreds of thousands or more of those can do freaking amazing stuff. And, okay, so now, let me tell you about, uh, this is the last part, and it's sort of the, some of the most fancy stuff you can do with text, but before I have to say, you know, the part that I didn't cover, and Greg is going to take you through this too, for a practical, uh, you know, 
practical exercises, is just the ability to take a bunch of text and do all the classifications, all the with, with deep learning, with deep learning, with learning networks. You can do classification, you can do sentiment analysis, you know, all this kind of stuff you can do easily with, uh, with those things. Okay, sequence to sequence. I gave a little talk one day, so I stole some of the slides, and that's what I called it at the time. Freakishly good idea. So, here's the problem. It's all formal. You have a sequence, yibig, of text. Yibig. And you want to turn it into a sequence of a different size. So, for example, you can translate French to English. And sentence, it doesn't have the same size, not the same world, not the same amount of you know, characters, whatever, it's going to be different. Um, question answer. Question answer. Different size. And so on. So, how do you do that? And obviously, you know, deep neural network, the standard stuff, fixed size, it's not going to work, so that's why user and end, but they don't know, so I've already sort of explained this. Use the STMs, and that does the trick. Um, so here's the, what the, so Google came up with this. We that Google came up with this about a year ago. This is what they came up with. You take an LSTM here, and you feed it English. This will crunch it, and whoever has the question in the neighborhood will come up with one vector that represents that sentence, the meaning of that sentence. The vector will be used as the entry point to the second LSTM, which will do exactly the same thing as the previous toy example. It will hallucinate the English translation, also the French translation. And the crazy part is this actually works. So this is trained by having a bunch of, you know, it's called online text. So you have an English sentence and a French sentence that mean the same thing. So this is about the one of the main things that European Union is good for. And all the stuff that is being translated, because <laughs> there are all the minutes have to be translated in you know, one of 12 different languages. So you get a lot of text like this. I think Canada also contributes a lot because of the French English stuff. So cool. Um, and so you train it by saying, you know, in training world, you say, yeah, this is your input, and this is what you're supposed to come out with. Train. And when you're done, you put my feet hurt, and you say, what do you think? All right, so the training is gone. Another thing we'll say, well, generally, it works. It's insane. No? Yes? <laughs> and several things are insane that you know only, you know, a reasonable amount of text would be enough to translate stuff that has nothing to do with the you know sentences that we use for training. That it works well enough, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it works well enough. And then the fact that this thing in between is literally the meaning of the text, because it's enough to capture it in English and to then generate the same meaning in a different language. So that's several crazies on top of each other. Yes? No? <laughs> so this is sort of the, the kind of stuff that people are you know, doing at the, at the forefront, and it's, as time goes, it's more and more crazy. There's another one, you didn't want to do slides, but uh, Google again, they, you know, they, they're pretty good. Um, they have basically shown in recent papers that you really don't need to bother with words for a lot of problems. You should be able to level of characters. In fact, not even characters, Unicode bytes. That's enough. You push Unicode bytes. And the, those things, they're powerful enough to learn how to go from Bytes to characters, characters to worlds, worlds to meaning, all in one fell swoop, and then keep going and doing your translation, for example. Okay? So, it, again, insane, shouldn't work, there's no reason why this works, but it does work. Which means, again, that those little puppies, they can learn a ton. And we, we haven't even figured out how much they can learn. So, that would be my, my current almost conclusion. This is what the thing looks like, just so you understand, it doesn't actually run on your iPhone yet. Okay, so I tried from the bay, it was all, the paper was a little obscure, so I tried to decode what exactly they had, and I think it looks like this. Then an LSTM of, uh, how does that work? Yes, they <coughs> fed, oh my god, I forgot. Okay, they 12 million sentence pairs, English French. Then 160,000 English worlds and 80,000 French worlds. Okay, they had. 
two LSTM families. Those LSTM was, were four deep, so this is another craziness. The LSTM, you can actually take the output of one and feed into the next one. So you can get your pattern of patterns and get incredible you know, learning power by doing this. So this is what that represents. And the result of this is each of them has basically two outputs times four times a thousand. Those vectors are 8,000 dimensional vectors. And then just because you wouldn't have enough power, they just put a thousand of those in parallel to get our oomph. Okay. <laughs> so that's that's one last yeah. And then similar thing on the decoding side and then you know again yeah, get little simple stuff to try to guess the next world. Okay? It took yeah, so it has you know a third of a billion weights parameters and it took ten days on eight GPUs, which I think is a bargain. So in eight days and ten Sorry, 10 days on 8 GPUs to learn those, you know, to train on those 12 million sentences we probably fed a bunch of times. Okay, so I mean, yeah, it's still, again, it's a pretty significant thing, but when we think about it, um, I think it goes beyond that. Is they were able to do things in such a way that they could, like, train the French encoder, English encoder, Vietnamese encoder, and then the French decoder, English decoder, Vietnamese, and then you could do, you know, Polish to Swahili without having ever seen a single sentence from both go away. Sorry, boss. Not today. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, so, you know, that thing even has that property. You could literally have, like, you know, if you have 50 languages, you have 50 of these and 50 of these, and you can do every possible pair on your works. All right. It's one more slide, two more slides, and we're done. And then we all talk. Okay, just one thing is, you know, conventional name that works are good for images and LSTMs are good for text. Yes, but not only for that. So people have played games where you can take images and feed them to an LSTM and you can do things like OCR and handwriting recognition because literally it's as it's an image but it's really a sequence. So people have done Handwriting recognition by doing the following. You take a line of text, or OCR, same stuff. You sort of scan it by moving a ball, and you, you know, where, where are the black and the white pixels? You move that. You take that, you feed it to an STM, and the thing will just learn to read. Because during training, you tell it, this sequence of dots map to that text. If you have enough of that, the thing learns, recognize the text. And this would be crazy. <laughs> so there's a case where STM is using images, and then people play with you know mix of the two to do things like image caption, where you need to train on you know here's this image, here's the caption of the image, and when you're done, you know you can recognize one really more crazy stuff. And conversely, I think Greg is going to talk about this a little bit. You can have networks that are convolutional neural networks, but they work on text. And then you throw an STM for the long-term effect of memorizing your know, structure or long-term thing. So it's not a it's not an absolute rule. They can be mixed. And I think this is my last slide coming. So I think I already mentioned this. I mean, today sort of the most performing things for a number of problems. This is just a very short list. Things like parsing, right? So being able to take a a, a chunk of text and understand the structure. Do the grammatical analysis. Where's the verb? And you know, this is the object for that. And, you know, um, the best parsers today are deep learning based. Post tagging. Sorry, this is a chopping world, including things like Chinese. Uh, post tagging is you know which which one is you know is this ing really the you know <coughs> that form that that grammatical thing or this other grammatical thing? Uh, classification, translation, and there's there's a long list. So in terms of you know the people who get into the you know ninety percent, ninety five percent, ninety seven percent these days it tends to be deep learning. But again, the classical method that doesn't assume you have you know the oom for Google take you to um, eighty five percent. Right. So you can get really good results with old classical methods that just run in your laptop. And this is when we bring back Greg from. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, wait. Just, just one second. 
questions about this? I have a question for the, the first slide. Yeah. yeah. The, first, the first slide with champagne. Yes. And we saw a list of words uh, that, that are related to champagne. Yes. What is the training set? Wikipedia. The training set is entirely uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia plus some web. I mean, it's just text, as much text as possible, talking about as many things as possible. Okay. That's it. Okay. And it's the same for all those examples. And it's the same legs and the same training set. I mean, I built them once. And then I just went and said, okay, what's around Champagne? What's around Brad Pitt? Mm. And so on. Okay. Any other question while well, this is all fresh in your mind? Yes. So, that's it. So, I understand how you could measure the proximity between two words. Yes. But what I don't understand is the direction, if you will. So, you could calculate the cosine. Wouldn't you only have one dimension? This word is, on average, 82 words away from this other word. This other word is 85 words away. Yeah, the distance is the same. It's just one of the measurements is the distance? No, 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 no. no the distance is similar to, remember when I, when, I, when I gave you the animal example? You know, is a mammal, has fur, has claws, whatever. <coughs> Those, that's the analogy for in the vectors, each of the numbers, each dimension. So the formula is literally, you want to compare two vectors, you do the product of the first two ones, the second, the third, and so on, and then you add all this. And the bigger that number is at the end, the closer they are. Okay? That's, okay, you have to divide by something, but let's forget that. So it's just like when you compute a cosine. That's really what you feel like, you know, x, y, and x, y, and you compute the cosine, it is going to be exactly that. So it's just a generalization to, you know, two and dimensional, which you have in two for the cosine of three. Okay. 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 Thank so you. It's, so it's simple math. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can make just a little break. We are live uh, putting productions on Linux. Text is very uh, interesting. How we are. Um, you, will, you will understand that you really need to train to train yourself, to understand, to play, to test, to collect data. Uh, it's really a huge and, and large um, aspect that you, you need to discover by yourself. You will find a lot of information online. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are not really. And you need to, to find, to, to train your own cla cla classifier. For, to be sure that this one is good, I don't need to lose time on this one. Because you will understand that you can, you know, I remember sometimes that I was working for many weeks on some elements for text. And during my breakfast, I wake up, I take my coffee, it's very hard for me, morning, before one, one liter, one, maybe five or six cups, it's very difficult for my brain to start. But oh, after it, it's, it's uh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, co I'm completely a coffee addict. And, uh, uh, but after the wide level of coffee, it's working pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and for a long time. That's another problem after. Because my wife said, okay, it's 2 a.m. Right now, maybe it's time to go to the bed. I said, okay, maybe, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a good idea right now. Um, no, just, it's, it's completely incredible. The, um, the data you really need before going more deeper in text for machine learning, deep learning, or whatever, you will need to understand what's the data at the end of the day, and where are the data, how you can work with that. And, and you know, before going to the data, you need to understand what you want to achieve, because it can be completely different. The data that you will need to find are really not the same one if you want to achieve maybe a boat or a personal assistant or a sentiment analysis or a smart reply because right now a smart reply really wired to be a hot topic for like Google yesterday and uh, it's, it's incredible it's really depending on what you really want to achieve at the end of the day and image it's like to be image okay an image it's an image but text are not a text. 
because you've got a lot of types of text. You've got the text from Twitter, the text from a blog, the text from a personal blog and a technical blog, whatever the topic about the technical stuff. You've got the newspaper, you've got Wikipedia, you've got uh, the web globally, and a lot of other types of source of data about the text and how to understand that. And when you understand this type of text, you need to classify in yourself how to work with the text. I heard a lot, I, I was on my computer because I, I tried to, to be focused on what Louis was saying and tried to find some element that I can show you right now as a clear sample um, and to explain what was the theory of, of Louis and how you can use and apply this one in the real life. But uh, first of all, you really need to understand what you want to achieve. And this is why I came back to this first slide. Do you want to create a classification? And classification get, can be on two classes, or maybe 100, 1,000, depending on what you want to achieve again. Uh, you've got some um, technique that you can use directly, as like the parsing, the spell checking, finding, the post tagging. We are really the first one, and I really like to say there is a long history of technology in text manipulation globally. And you get the first level where you will try to understand and extract the meaning of a sentence or a question. But when you, you do that, you are just at the first level. And I don't know after 20 years how many levels there is. I don't know. I clearly don't know because when you understand what's the question and how to answer to the question, but what's the question after? And what's the question after after? And it's exactly as like you and me. You are listening, you will have some question, I will answer, and your question will change what I will explain to you, and we create together the path to go to the right element. That's the big difference between, in this case, about both, who are very hard for the moment. First level of semantic uh, dialogue between a human and a machine. And I think it's pretty smart from Facebook, Microsoft, and uh, Google right now, and not Apple, I will, I will explain you after, um, to, to come back to the boat. Because the boat is you can ask a question, a very small one in the chat um, uh, window on your computer, on your phone, and you, you get the answer directly, with maybe some button. And you don't need to ask again a new, a new question. If you remember the demonstration about Mark Zuckerberg when they launched the boat on Facebook, it was about a uh, thousand flowers. And he said, I will, I will purchase some flowers online. And if you remember, there were some steps inside of uh, the boat and the relationship between the human and the machine. And the steps was for a part text and for a part button directly inside of the uh, chat window. And the virtual assistant with more the personal assistant, as you, as you can say, it's how you create a conversation how you take care about the context, how you take care about the domain. And it's completely different because you are at the level of the sentence where you need to extract the meaning, but when you've got this meaning, you need to create a memory in the system. We will understand about the two questions that I will explain you. What's the weather? You will provide me the weather for today and for the place here. And in Paris, but you remember directly that when I, I'm seeing why I'm in Paris, I'm not saying about, is there an Eiffel Tower in Paris? I'm asking about the weather in Paris. And tomorrow, and Sunday. It's really how you create the dialogue and the relationship and the steps in the dialogue and the, uh, the conversation directly. And today you get a lot of tools that you can use for this one, but you know it's really an open area for the moment. You really need to work very hard and I will try to explain you what's the different step and how you can create 
this one. But before, just come back on what you can create with this one. Look at the article that I send you directly. Yeah. It's a, a professor built a chatbot for teaching assistant. It's really question answering in this case. Maybe there is some dialogue that you can use directly and have a, what we can call the flow of the dialogue and the conversations. Another one which is very interesting, and we were speaking together for another case, but the world first artificial intelligence lawyer was just hired in the law firm. That's crazy. How many people we will switch to the machine to do the job? Because it's very hard to access to a high level of content and have the capability in real time to find inside of this content where are the right information that you are looking for Why right now. It's, it's very difficult. You need to have a high level of expertise and reading a lot of papers to have the right answer about that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Just do it. And uh, this one, uh, can you maybe click on, on, the, on the next? You're <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good assistant. Yeah. <laughs> and first of all, you need to understand what's the different type, types of information globally and data while you are going in the text. And I really like the, this approach who is, first of all, you've got data. When you get data, you collect, oh, you collect a lot, oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we collect a lot of data. <laughs> you collect a lot of data, and as we explain you, you can collect data from Wikipedia, Common Core, um, social network, um, a lot, a lot of elements. And you need to put that at, in what we call a bag of words, and bag of sequences. <laughs> Can you this one? <laughs> you want to take a two minute break? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it was just a personal assistant. I'm, I'm working on a personal project with you connect the engine to any website, and you dialogue with the website. The system will read the website for you, coming back, restructure the data, restructure the knowledge, restructure the information at the end of the day. Okay? And create the dialogue and the magic after. Now I want that you are coming back. Yeah, yeah, I think this one, yes, thank you. It's how you are going from the data to the information, and information has many linked elements. It's what we can, it's about uh, uh, weather and the tone. It's about uh, color and car. It's what we call tuple. It's the ontology. How you create the relationship between information and how you can use this one after. The first one is really how you grab the data, how you collect the data from any website. I like to explain that our team, and the team that I'm managing for the moment is a small team, less than 20 people. But I think that at the end of the day, we are maybe 100. Because I have a lot of boats who are working for me. They are doing the job that I needed by the past to hire a person to do that. And the job are very simple. It's it's completely it's, uh, collecting data and transforming, transforming data from, from an open format to information and transforming information to knowledge. And after that, using knowledge to be a useful application in a boat, in a personal system, maybe a customer support as a website. Maybe just an assistant for the people at the call center who need to answer to any customers because you want to have at the end of the day human. But you can create an assistant of the human. And at the end of the day, everyone wants to have an assistant. You want to have this assistant who can really help you in the life and find information from you, for you. And you know that in my case, my Twitter account is not me. I have a personal assistant who is doing the job for me. 
she's reading a lot of articles, maybe more than um, many um, thousand uh, articles per day. She's reading this one, come back to me and say, Greg, uh, today the resume, I, I started from maybe a half million articles today. I come back with maybe 10,000. And when I'm clusterizing everything, I have maybe 30 articles who are very interesting for you. She's doing an incredible job. There are some companies who got a lot of people who are doing that directly. And it's really how you can create smart system who can work directly with the human. And after the last level, but I think we got a long time before with artificial intelligence to arrive at this level is wisdom. Can I take back my computer? <laughs> Thank you. Is it okay? No. surprise for me end of the last year. Uh, it's an insurance company who called us and said, Greg, can you maybe at the time use your technology that you are doing for car and appliance, but can you use this technology for call center and customer support? I said, okay, at the end of the day, if you are integrating this one in the chatbot, uh, we know maybe yes, we can do that. And the customer said to me, yeah, but I don't have any data. I said, okay, we don't have data to let me work and to model this kind of elements. <laughs> and she said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Greg, I don't, I, I have only uh, customer's contract. It's, I, I have only the, the paper that I'm providing to my customer that maybe can help you. And the topic was really particular because it was insurance for school, insurance for home, insurance for car and a lot of elements, a lot of other elements. And I said, okay, how can we recreate a system who can understand, classify and answer the question of the customer? So I said, clearly, you are speaking to me about insurance for school, or you are speaking to me about insurance for home. And how you are doing this kind of system, how you can build from scratch, from nothing, this kind of system. And first of all, you need to collect the data. Collect the data. But what are the type of data? First of all, you got your peers. That's what you signed up for. Yeah. That was Silvan's automated system. Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. First of all, you get what we call the structured data. And the unstructured data. The big difference, if you need to think very easily and quickly, the first one you can put the information inside of a spreadsheet, the other one you can't. 
in the other world, you can say this one is what we can call language. And after you, you have a lot of regard types. After this one, were uh, static, but you can apply this one here too, and dynamic. Static is about your data will never change very easily, or maybe they will change, but with a long time series. Dynamic, they will change. And if you are working on uh, data who are uh, unstructured and static, you can have a lot of issues. I will explain you another one. We integrated for a car manufacturer a personal system inside the car with some demonstration and some demonstration was about information from Wikipedia. You are in your car and you want to ask a question and the system can answer to you. And for that one we use Wikipedia. Wikipedia is pretty cool, we got a lot of information that we can use directly and we downloaded what we call the dump from Wikipedia to recreate the ontology about this one and the relationship between the whole element. And we arrived at a high level of capability of answering. Type of question we was able to do was about what's the, the date of birth of uh, the woman, of the mayor, of the capital of Spain. Imagine a lot of uh, analyze you need to do to arrive at the right result at the end of the day. And it was working fucking good for a lot of elements. <laughs> And you are so proud of us, and you said, we did it. The day of the demonstration was, I completely forgot that one. The, the, the day of the demonstration was some weeks after election in France. And the guy who was one of the managers of the car company came inside of the car and we explained, we made a lot of demo, was really not focused on election people and political people. And he said, okay. What's the, may, uh, what's the mayor of uh, um, this uh, town? What's the mayor of Paris or what's the mayor of Lille? And the answer was good, but four weeks ago. <laughs> it was another person, why not? And the result at the end of the day was, it's not working. <gasps> you said, no, it's not possible that it's not working. It's working, and yeah. The answer was bad. Okay, it was fair. The answer was bad just because what? We was working on what we call static data. And that's a huge part of the job why now. You need to really understand what's the difference between the static data and the dynamic data. And how you can create a life cycle to collect data and to continuously improve your static data how you can really roast in the data that you will collect. It's really like the coffee at the end of the day. You are roasting the coffee to have the good coffee at the end. It's exactly the same one for the data. And it's really an expertise area that you need to work if you want to go on this one. And there is no, big, uh, no particular answer or big solution. There is just levels to arrive on this one. When you are in the dynamic data, okay. When you are in the dynamic data, you will have uh, recurrent, who are more as like the news, the blogs, this kind of elements, Wikipedia maybe sometime or that, depending on type of elements. And you've got what one of the elements I really like is ephemeral. Ephemeral is you don't collect the data, you will never find again the data. What can be ephemeral about? What's, what's the type of data? It's data from Twitter, social network, LinkedIn, this kind of information, maybe chat directly, uh, Slack. You've got a lot of information on Slack. People are speaking together. And just go inside of the dialogue from the people together to understand how they are communicating together. And you can collect this information to train a model after. And you remember what we was explaining you about sequence to sequence to use as maybe 
translation, or maybe to use as a capability to find an answer to a first question, to maybe find, as we did for the addition, um, find the, the, the result of an addition of two numbers. It's exactly the same one, and you can take all the discussion and say, okay, I understand that for all of this question I have this type of answer. And you can completely recreate this one, but take care. What was the bad uh, result? <coughs> that is one we just discovered some weeks ago. What is the, the effect that we don't want to have? It was completely public for a big company in the US. They launched something and the result was pretty bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Microsoft. Exactly. Microsoft. Stray. What's happening to this platform? It was a sequence to sequence who was learning. It's what we call the reinforcement learning from what you are exchanging with the system. And the system is learning from what you are exchanging with the system directly to continuously take information from the dynamic and integrate inside of the static to come back to the last result. And they fix that because at the end of the day, if you want to put in production some elements, why now when I'm asking to my customers, I was in the call again this morning with some big customers in Europe, I said, we just integrate this new type of algorithm, etc. And they want to have the control. They don't want to let the control to the machine completely. If you want to have the control to any question you are asking to your system, you need to find what's the right architecture to put in place. And you remember, Louis explained you that we got the vectors, and we got some other elements who are the semantic, semantic analysis, and what we can call the keyword word matching. It's three strategy with three types of framework that we can use and it's how you can build the system completely. You will use the vectors through the recurrent neural network that we can call the LSTM. We will come back on this one after. If you want maybe to do just a classifier. Okay, I have some news. I know the type of the news because I'm really focused on the financial news, maybe for stock market, completely. I know the classification of this one, I have maybe 200 classification, and I want for each new news who are arriving, classify and say this news is maybe on this bucket, or this other bucket, this group or another group. I can use the semantic analysis. Semantic analysis is exactly what we will show you here. Oh. I know why. I'm here. Yeah. It's about how you will do the post stacking, the spell checking, um, finding uh, synonyms and lemmatization of your words and how you will come back to all the elements, rework the words to find what's the meaning, what are the elements that I can use. And finally, the last one is what we call the keyword matching. You've got the word car in your sentence and can match directly the word car because it's exactly the same letters in the same sequence. I know that is the word car. And why I will use the three types of approach is just because, depending on the quality of the services you need to integrate and put in place for your customer. If you want to have the control, you need to manage where you need to go between the three strategies. It's really as like this one. I have a schema where the graph, we have keyword machine, we have semantic, and vectors, depending of what you want to achieve, you will decide where you are. If your system is more based on uh, vectors with deep learning and machine learning, or if you need to work more on semantic analysis or keyword machine. 
But don't worry, you will have a lot of framework that will take a look while about this one. And just to start, how can I keep it here? And the first one is uh, what we call the Stanford Core NLP. Stanford Core NLP was, I don't remember, one of the first ones I used by the past. And I really want to advise you to test this one because right now the Core NLP in the new version integrating directly uh, neural network inside of this one. And you can directly work with the three types of levels of text analysis directly with the Stanford Core NLP. Um, we will try to understand why now, what's it, what we got here directly. And look at the type of the element we got. We will just go through some, into some concepts. The first one is really how you can detect the domain that you are working on. How you can detect the intent. How you can work on the entities. And from the entities doing what we call the slot filling. And for this one, we've got the first one who are already what we call the name entity recognition. And how we can recognize that we've got some particular things inside of sentences like a place, a person, a, a person, a localization, an ordinal, a location here, a date, and uh, countries, this kind of things, place, etc. When you've got this one, it's very easy because if I'm asking what's the weather in Paris, I know that what's my intention? My intention is asking the weather, what's, what's the weather that I want to, to have as an information? And the entity is a place. And this one is very interesting because I have directly from my sentence to information the type of the entity and the information of this entity. I know the place, I know that I have an element with a place, and I know that the place is Paris. And I find another element who is uh, the intent of my sentence in this particular case, who is, who is, who is weather. And I know that I have the place with Paris. And based on these three information, I can <coughs> create a query. It suggests how you will move to a natural language, to what you are knowing already today, SQL. And I will not say only SQL, but globally how you are recreating a query from a sentence. That's a, a big part of our job is how we can really extract, and when I said how you're extracting the meaning of a sentence is no more than that. You need to extract the raw information and after to find the right pattern to match on it, to connect to any APIs or whatever as you want. It's exactly as I'm in my car and I said, I need to do the maintenance of my car. What's the meaning here? Maintenance. He will directly find to this one what's the white pattern. He will come back to me and say, okay, Greg, I'm saying in the information of your car that you need to do the maintenance, or maybe you don't need to do. And it's how you will recreate because you will just ask him for information. Exactly as like you are doing any query on your da <coughs> database globally. And the work about the instructor data is really no more than the work that you are doing with the structured data. But you just need to create the bridge between the unstructured data and the structured data. That's your job as an NLP player. It's how you will do these kind of things. For that, Core NLP will allow us to extract the name entity recognition. And we have a lot of elements about name entity recognition. I will come back. OK, how can I? Um, I just took the time quickly to, to provide you some elements about name entity 
organization, person, location, date, time, money, percent, facility, GPU, G, uh, GPU. That's the type, and you can create your own type if you want. Because at the, at the end of the day, what are name entity? They are no more than a list of elements that you will use as a hash table to find if they are directly in the hash table or not. And you have a lot of tools, as like Lucene, that you will discover by the time in, a, the, in the world of the natural language. But that's the, the element that you will have directly. And you got after what we call the post tagging. The post tagging, if you understand why now, what's the name entity extraction, and the post tagging are exactly the same one, but with the structuration of the sentence. What's an adjective that uh, determine a cardinal, um, a noun, a predeterminer, and you just want to extract what's the structure of your sentence to use it directly with um, the, the entities and recreate in real time your query to arrive at the end of the day at the capability to match on the pattern or maybe to match to an API or maybe to match to data in a database directly. You see, it's not so difficult but you need a lot of train to clearly arrive at the right level and more than that, the uh, user experience. You have exactly in the same way some elements as like the co-reference. It's really the reference about elements to another one. If I'm doing a long sentence and I'm speaking about the same person, I need to know where you are speaking about the person or another step or maybe another person. You've got some basic dependencies and complex dependencies. I'm, I'm, I'm going here to this first uh, step, but you can directly please take uh, the link that you got here and you can use directly for yourself and to, uh, to test how it's working, how you can use this one. Because at the end of the day, I remember the time when I was creating this kind of stuff by myself from scratch. But I know you've got a lot of framework to let you save a lot of time and to understand clearly and easily how it's working. Uh, I just took the, the sentence that we got on the website of uh, Red Burton. Uh, I went to Red Burton. I took here the, the sentence on the, on the, the web page. And I asked for the structure of the document. Just the system working on it. And you can see that directly it recreated for you the part of speech. Look at that's the, the organization, that's the structure of your sentence, known, uh, verbs, adverbs, this kind of elements. And please don't think that you can say, okay, but I don't need to use is, a, two, four, d. It's what we call the stop words. Stop words are words that you don't want to use inside of the sentence to analyze the sentence. Very important in some cases to use, not to delete. Because you will create the process who is coming from the sentence. From the sentence you extract words and stop words. You split and you can work only on the words. Or you can work words and stop words directly. <coughs> you have a lot of stop words who are directly um, available on, online on, uh, on frameworks and this kind of elements to let you work on it. But the stop words, while you are working with the vectors, we will come back to this point after, seems to be very important. There is a lot of meaning inside of this one as like typical expression that we cannot understand if we don't have the stop words directly inside of the sentence. We've got the name entity uh, recognition. And look at who is very interesting because he understood the Halberton School was an organization. Very interesting to see that 
the doctor understood is not a very hard organization, but he already understood this one. The co-reference is the reference between the elements, and you get here directly the verb who is between them. The basic dependency and enhance dependency. Don't worry, we will come back on this one time by time and how you can use this type of tools. And but you just need today to understand what, what, what are the high level concepts to really understand and after all go deeper in scientism. <coughs> Core NLP, a very useful tool. Another tool that we got and who is very, very interesting too is NLTK. Who know NLTK? Okay, perfect. Some, some people here are already using NLTK. NLTK is very useful uh, if you are working mainly in the uh, universities and scientific stuff. Uh, please don't use too much NLTK as a production. There is a lot of people who are doing that, but there is more powerful tools who are more quick about the execution. We will come back on this one directly after. In NLTK, you have all the elements you want to do as a text an analysis. You've got everything. Limitization, uh, post tagging, to, to tokenizing, uh, sentiment analysis. I think that by now you've got already some um, neural network directly integrated inside. And if you are only doing some analyze on text and you don't need to work in real time, please use an LTK. It's pretty quick, pretty useful. And on GitHub, you've got a lot of uh, sample that you can directly. Uh, integrate inside of your development. Uh, just quickly, and to see how it's very simple, you've got here the tokenization. Look at my sentence. I have import directly an LTK in Python. I have my sentence, and it will provide me directly the tokenization. Tokenization just mainly to going from a sentence to a tokenization of words. It's how you create, well, how you are going from a sentence to a list of words. And after you've got what we call the post tagging, and post tagging is to define the type of each word and how you are working with this one. And after you can continue with the name entity, uh, extraction. Here directly you've got all the elements, and I can continue to parse the tree of the sentence. And here it becomes very interesting. Yeah. Because I have directly here the tree of my sentence. And it's really more visual. I can understand clearly here how my sentence is organized. And depending on the type of parsing tool, you will maybe not have the same tree for the same sentence. It's why at the end of the day you can use a technique and a platform or a framework, and it will not each time provide you the right answer that you are expecting for. It's why you really need to train and to define at the start of your work how you will evaluate the result of what you are doing. Because you will have a lot of results who will be very really good, and some part of the result will be not good. But you need to define how you will evaluate to see is it good or not. And you remember the training set and the testing set. It's exactly the same approach. You need to define how you can validate your work. That's my tree. And after, to some programming stuff, I can directly go inside of my tree and understand how it's working. This one is very important about sentiment analysis. Because depending <coughs> on the tree of my sentence, I can have an evaluation with positive or negative. Sentiment analysis is just a technique about machine learning and deep learning to try to understand what's the meaning of a sentence or a paragraph, and no, so sorry, not, not, not the meaning, but what's the sentiment. It's mainly used by companies who have got uh, communities online where people can post some feedback about what they are doing the product or whatever. And you need to understand quickly if there is any people who are pretty angry about your company, <laughs> if they are not happy. 
and because you can really hack quickly. But as you've got a lot of people who are speaking about your product, it's very difficult to find all the conversation and be sure that you can detect a person who is really not happy about what you are doing. You can use this type of elements. But it's very uh, complicated to be sure that you get the right sentiment. You can arrive at a, right, at a high <coughs> level of accuracy, but sometimes you really need to, have, to define at the start how you will evaluate the result of your work. That's the first one. An LTK, we, we, we define, we discovered a core NLP, an LTK, and why not we go to <coughs> Jensen? But for this one, before coming back to, to Jensen, I will uh, play this one, explain you what I'm doing here. It's uh, in real time. Uh, I'm loading my model and I will explain you what is happening here. Uh, I'm working with a space vector. my words and you remember we explain you that you can really find the similarity between whole elements directly inside of the same space vector and your space vector is really defined by you and by the data set that you are using at the start to generate your vector your, your space vector directly if you are taking maybe all the information from your website, you can generate a space vector, but maybe you don't have enough information to generate a white space vector and a good one about the quality. You, think you need to find some tips and tricks to arrive at the white level. We will see how it works. But in this case, how we work? We just took for this sample the dumps from Wikipedia. You are going on Wikipedia, you are looking for the dumps. The dumps are no more than the text that you've got without the HTML. You can collect the text from any website to some tools, as like uh, Beautiful Soup, with one of very easy, Curl. You can collect a lot of web page, and from the web page, you just split the text from the HTML. And you are using the text as a data set to train your own space vector and find what are the vectors that you can use directly. Because don't understand why we are using vectors. Why vectors are, are working so pretty well? It's just because the computer will never understand the world. A computer is just seeing letters, and for letters, it's just seeing <coughs> an index. No more than that. But the computer will be able to understand the relationship between words. You will understand that this one is a cup of coffee. And maybe you've got a cup of tea. Or a glass of water. Or a glass of beer. This kind of element. The system will understand the relationship between the word elements. It will just recreate a vector with representing the relationship between any words to the, all the other words you've got inside of the bag of words. And your bag of words is creating from your data set that you collected directly. I have my space vector. In whole case, it's a 40k... Uh, so sorry, uh, 400,000 uh, k vectors with dimension of 200. Each word is represented by a vector of 200 rare numbers. And I will use this one after to do all the other elements who are here. The first one is to search the top five words of car, exactly as we showed you uh, in the theory part. Be sure that you can find for any words all the synonym, but not only the synonym, but the words who are close from, as like king and queen. It's exactly the same one. We will see here what is happening for car. OK. 
Okay. Okay, we can see here that for car, we've got car, vehicle, driving, driver, and truck. And for each one, I have the accuracy. The accuracy is, in who has more the similarity accuracy? You say that cars have a 81% of accuracy from car. Vehicle, 76, driving, 76, and, and so far for the, the other one. Same one for woman, king, and men, if I'm coming back. <coughs> And we can see here directly that the system found well queen. But you don't find only queen. It's, it's, more, it's too much easy. When you are looking online, they said, okay, I'm providing the world's work. Woman plus king minus man, and you will find queen. No, no way. You will find a lot of elements. And you will find queen, throne, game of throne maybe, no. <laughs> kingdom, uh, princess, her son, and look at her son. I don't understand why. But it's really about the space vector and how are the elements. But how you prevent your system against this kind of things. Because I want to come back at the start of the class and the practical part. When I said, my customer need to have the control about the answer that the system will provide to the customer at the end of the day. How you are doing this one? How you are sure that when you will ask about woman, king, and men, you will not say, or son? No sense. I cannot understand this one. It's really how you will create the elements. And for that part, you need to use many types of strategy. It's exactly, I really like to explain that exactly as like the voice. Uh, I think that everyone knows voice. Uh, with a TV show about you get four people, the guy who tried to sing, and uh, <laughs> people said, OK, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm hot. That's the same one. You create a democracy of artificial intelligence. You are not doing only one thing. You are doing a lot of things that you can directly use as a quorum to say, it seems to be queen at the end of the day. Because you will start from here. You want to arrive at queen, and you will use maybe four or five paths and maybe on the four or five paths, path, you will have two or three who will say, it's green. But if I have three answers who are green for five, I can say the probability that it's green at the end of this is pretty good. And you remember what I said at the start. We've got different types of approach who are keyword matching, semantic analysis, and vectors. Vectors, we can call this one word embeddings. It's more word embeddings, because vectors, we will see that you can use vectors in other type of uh, machine learning for text analysis. Another who is more interesting about this one, it's about, uh, if I'm asking uh, similarity, uh, what is the weather and do I need to take <coughs> I'm pretty sure if you are asking to Siri about that he will provide you for the two sentences the same answer who will be the answer? Okay, you can answer to that what can be the answer for the two sentences here? So, oh, you know. Yeah, exactly. We we'll maybe said, Greg, the weather is that. You need to take a call. Or just, Greg, that's the weather for today. 
it will provide me the weather at the end of the day. I have two sentences who arrive at the same action. And that's another big important thing that you need to understand with the text. What you want to achieve? Are you doing classification? Do you need to provide an answer? Is this answer is more as like providing knowledge or have an action? Weather is not knowledge. Weather is an action. The action is to go to an API, find information, exactly as like a query, coming back, put in the pattern of sentence, and come back to me with the beautiful pictures. I hope you did work. Yeah. That's unbelievable. The system don't know anything, but it can understand here that the similarity between what is the weather and do I need to take a coat? It's about 79. Nine. Awesome. Can we make another test with a uh, correct uh, sentence? Yeah, of course. So, what is the weather and uh, uh, who is the king? I don't know. What did we read into this one? No, what is the weather? What? Uh, we'll use what is the weather? Yeah. Uh, and uh, who is the king uh, or something like that? Uh, we use the queen. Uh, no, uh, and thank you for that. <laughs> That's another big point. You get the same type of similarity. And that one really proves what I just said to you. You need to work as what? As a co -op. You need to have exactly as like the voice. Because you don't know if the system will clearly answer <coughs> to you this type of element. Exactly as Louis explained you, vectors are pretty close to everything at the end of the day. And you need to have some elements. This one is very interesting. And you need to train the right level of data set to create your space vector. In this case, it's really a small one, about 400,000 vectors, based on uh, 200 dimension. In the whole case, when we are going in production, we are using system based on a billion words and million vectors. Because we will have a better accuracy about the result. This one is really one we created quickly, and I can come back to another one who is very interesting too. Um, I can, yeah, where is it here? I think so. I can detect what's not. It seems that builder doesn't match with car, truck, and plane. And if I'm coming back to the two sample here, I work as like a sentence, but I can work as a word. I can do exactly with the same technology, different type of tests. I can say, okay, I will analyze the similarity between two sentences regarding the similarity of any words in the two sentences, saying this one as uh, tokens directly. I can work with the tokens without the stop words. I will not have the same type of answer if I'm coming back um, on the two sentences where what is the weather? I will, we can just test what imagine that we are not using is the kind of elements with green and that becomes very interesting why not because when I'm using the whole sentence for the two sentences I have a pretty good similarity but they are not similar but if I'm taking out the stop words that become more interesting. And why now you understand 
the importance of the, the practice that you need to train your own brain about the architecture or what you can put in place. How you can create the right voice system for your algorithm and for your application. I can use directly uh, the similarity between the two sentences here with the stop words and the same one without the stop words and I can do directly a keyboard machine set okay, I want to see if I have the same words inside of the two sentences if you can do that directly by yourself because if I'm taking the two sentences if I try to find the similarity just based on the keywords what's globally the average, the accuracy I will have between what is the weather and with, and with the queen if I'm looking the two tokens what is the weather with the queen? I have only one word with similar and with only common between the two sentences. I will have a very low level of similarity. And in this case, I can create a third evaluation of my two sentences. And if I'm doing an average about the three elements, I will be able to say, that's not the same. I'm sorry. And why not if you are thinking well, you will say, Greg, it seems pretty good what you are saying, pretty smart. But it's not working in some parts of the vocabulary and sentences. I want to come back on the first sample who was, who was what is the weather and do I need to take a coat? I cannot work with the keyboard machine. The level of my similarity <coughs> between the two sentences are pretty low. But it's the same action at the end of the day. How I can manage that? Oh my gosh. That becomes completely crazy. It's why you really need to work with different types of systems because I will provide you another elements, another one who, who make me crazy. When I will say crazy, it was really crazy. At the level that my wife said, Greg, why not you close your computer? I just booked an hotel at the Lactao for tonight. We will go there, you don't take your computer with. Or you will find another woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's true. I have high level of passion of woman and she's really incredible for that. And um, the problem was pretty simple. The world next. Just the word next. I'm creating a system for the car. And you said, Cool Louis. Super Greg, I have 20 Louis inside of your contact list. I will read you the, the, five, the five first in your list. Do you want the next? Or when the system arrives at the end, I need to say next. And I'm using the word next for providing news in my car. When I'm driving in my car, I said to my system, um, what's the news today? And what's the news about technical stuff? And the system is reading me the news after news, but he, from each part of this, I said, next. And when I'm going to a particular news, I will say, the next news. How the system will use this one and understand that is the next news or is the next group of contact? or maybe it's the next group of whatever information about the list of the garage inside of my system and so far and it becomes completely crazy how do you think you can serve this one? how do you think? how can we serve this one? it's exactly as like um, I don't find a clear sample in English or all that but You've got exactly the same sentence. If you are with friends, if you are at your office, <coughs> if you are maybe on vacation, and the sentence don't have the same meaning. Do you have some sample for that? How we can detect that it's not the same query at the end of the day? How do you think? <coughs> exactly, the context. It's no more than the context of your system. 
the context I'm asking the question, I want to have an answer. <coughs> and I'm asking exactly the same question with the answer 1, and I want to have the, the answer 2. But it's the question one for each one. It's just because my question with my context will provide an ans a particular answer. If I'm asking for something in my kitchen and I'm asking for the same one, I'm, what's the problem? If I'm in front of my TV, it seems to be evident it will be a TV program. What's the program in my TV? If I'm in front of me on my computer, it will be about maybe what's the program that you are creating. If I'm in front maybe to an event, what's the program of the event? This kind of elements. And that's exactly how you are working with the context. And you need to work on this one to improve the information that you get here to be sure that you can really understand. And I say that at the end of the day, if I need to provide the right answer to any question inside of the text and a query, I need to understand what's the similarity by many strategy, and I can use the context where I am to understand. If I just asked for maybe the weather, I know that it will be again the weather. And I can ask maybe for the weather, the stock market. And after, if I'm asking maybe for a new town with San Francisco, and I was speaking before about Paris, you will understand that there is no stock market for San Francisco. And the system will say, OK, but it's not the right context. But what was the story of the context? And you will understand that the context before was about the weather. And if you got the entity with the location, with the place, San Francisco, with the context, oh, it's working pretty well. I have a pattern for that. And I can say, OK, I will take the opportunity to provide to the customer, to the people who are asking something about the weather. And when you understand slowly what's the complexity of the text, regarding uh, computing image. But why not? We are discovering a lot of things for, for, for image. And you can do a lot of very complex things too for the image. Any question about this one? Maybe one question, no? How we are doing that? No, so when it comes to creating a context, have you created multifaceted context? Let's say oh, yeah, multiple yeah. dimensions, yeah. geographical, you know. All right. Yeah. For um, a context is not only one variable. Right. The context is really many variables. If you are speaking about the context, you can say, okay, it's maybe the context based on my history, what I was doing before. It's how you are creating the system as like, what's the weather and tomorrow? Because when I say tomorrow with the context of weather, <coughs> it matches perfectly, I have a pattern for that. It's about maybe the place where I am. When I say the place, it's about the localization of the sensor of my phone in some time. Maybe the localization of my car directly. You get the event. Very simple. There is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of events. And there is the capability to work with the combination of a lot of sub-events. <laughs> we provide you one that we created for car manufacturers. That the guy said, how you did it? Um, just while you are driving, you can do your email with your system when you are driving to the car. And you can receive email. And the system will come back to you and say, Hey Greg, you've got an email from Celine. Do you want that I'm reading the email to you? Why not? And when I'm alone in my car, it's perfect. But if I'm with a person in my car, maybe I don't want. And we can detect from any seat, from the seat belt, that you are seat on the on the passenger seat, 
and there is someone. And we can detect in this case, because if I'm alone in my car, you don't need to ask me if I want that you are willing, that, that you, you read the email. I want to say, go on directly. But if I have someone in my car, I want that you are asking me if you need to read the email. It's how you are smart. And the second one who was completely crazy said, because it's very dangerous, imagine I'm, I'm driving very quick and I need to break right now because there is something. Or maybe I need to go out of the highway, I need to be concentrated only on driving, no more than that. We are detecting the sensors from the car and we know that you are doing something dangerous. If I'm receiving a message at this time, I will wait until you finish this action to start the action directly and said, you get an email, why not? That's what we can call the context based on the events. And you've got a lot, a lot of elements that you have. You will maybe know about that, social. I can detect what's your mood. Just because I'm just putting production sentiment analysis on your Twitter account, and I know in your system of your car, what's your Twitter account? I can detect, understand, come back, said, it seems that today Greg is a little bit stressed. Just because it's not about clearly about the word that I'm using, but about my sentiment analysis history. I know that my average is maybe 45% of positive or 55% or high T, whatever. And I know that today there is a change about the type of the words and how you construct your sentence. What's the organization of your words? And what's the sentiment? I know this one and I can come back to you. And while you are driving, I said, hey Greg, it seems that you are not very happy today. Do you want to have good music? Oh my gosh, how you know that? Hmm. We did it these kind of things. But it's not working at 100%. It's really what I want to explain you. It's more as like a Pareto system, 80-20. It's why you need to be very confident and you need to find exactly what the system is doing to not go in the wall as like, try and did it. You need to understand, and thank you Microsoft for this huge experience about this type of system. Is it okay? Other question? I bet the context is awesome. And it's why you get the question answering, and you understand that you have some strategy about that depending what you want to do. We can say the old school and the new school, but it's not because we are saying the old school that we need to don't use the old school. The school is doing an incredible job. But it's mainly how we can use uh, word embeddings and uh, semantic analysis globally. I will not speak about keyword matching. But I will just come back one minute on keyword matching. Keyword matching is an incredible system about the speed of the answer. You remember when I showed you a prototype or application we developed two years ago? and the speed of the answer. I'm speaking to the system, it directly answers in real time, very quick, there is no break inside of the system. And you need to find between the three types of organization and algorithm that you want to use, the which one is the best one. It's like a domino. First one, if you can use the quicker, please use this one. Keyword matching with hash table are awesome. It's in the right time. Semantic analysis need more time. And vectors, a little bit more. And you need to find what's the, the best usage of the, this technology to put the usage you want at the end of the day. And not only for one user, but at scale. There is a huge difference between books. Any other question? Is it okay? Um, how I created this one, and it's maybe one of the 
on the workshop that you can do after. It's with Jensi. How you generate um, a space, space vector that you will use? You will use what we call work to vec how, how you are going from your data set to your bag of word or sentences to your space vector? You can use right now some type of framework directly. One of the best that I'm using regularly to create my prototype is really Jensen. You've got Jensen, you've got work to vec Glove, who are, I think, at the end of the day, the best. And why right now, um, the embeddings, the world embeddings generation is more and more integrated in a lot of other type of framework. It's where I will download it, here my corpus and look at just generate my model. Imagine, it was really complicated and I explained you a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's just two lines. Oh my gosh. Thank you, the community, to do that. Because you understand why right now that the key point if you are in a company and you need to serve text analysis or whatever is doing about the natural language processing, the hard part of the job is not in the tools or the technical or the code. It's about the user experience you need to create and the accuracy you need to provide at the end of the day. And you need to do a lot of tests for that one because it will be completely different for each topic. If I'm working in a very large language model, it's very hard. You saw with the sample that I showed you directly, what's the weather, and do I need to take a quote? You don't know about what I'm speaking. But if I'm doing a model really focused on the car market, I will only use data set and information from car area. I will download community information, I will download uh, the user guide about the cars, uh, FAQ from a lot of websites for car manufacturer or whatever, and I will create a space vector really dedicated to the car market. But please don't ask about recipe to the car market. It's why you need to create your own organization about from the language to a particular domain. It's why if you remember, I was speaking about how you, you can define from a sentence entities and uh, token, uh, post tagging, this kind of element to recreate your query. You understood that if we can understand the sentence, we need to understand what's the context. And on top of that, we have what's my domain. The sentence, the analyze of the sentence and the context are directly inside of the Q&A. We are using the context directly. And the domain is more to help us to understand what is the type of the data set we need to use to generate the space vector that we want to understand globally what's the sentence and what's the meaning of the sentence. It's exactly how we are doing, and you can see here after the matrix similarity, I can do that for uh, another type, but if I want to find the similarity between two sentences, it's very simple because I'm generating my model, and as I generated my model, I will just provide the two sentences the two sentences directly inside of my similarity function. And it will provide me back what's the accuracy of the similarity between the two sentences. Jensen is an incredibly powerful tool. And um, if I'm coming back on my code,
Look at here, I've got the model similarity, group of words one and group of words two. You can see that I'm not speaking about sentences because we are only speaking about the group of words. And the order of the words are very important in a sentence because you can use exactly the same words in two types of organization and order and you will not have the same meaning for the same words in sentences. And in this case, I can extract the sense. I have my words, and look at at the end of the day, everything is working from this one. Very easy with Jensen. I can do that directly inside of my code, and I will provide directly all the information. And don't forget to manage your exception because what is happening when you got a space vector when you don't have a vector who is representing a word. Thinking about what we said in the middle of the class today, when I said the difference between the static and the dynamic data set, it's exactly the same for the vectors. You need to verify in your sentence if your word have a representation as a vector or not before doing any analyze. If you are not doing this one, you will generate a lot of error directly. But at the end of the day, if you generate, if you can detect these elements, and you can extract, and you can generate a pipeline, we will try to find more data sets online to collect information, and coming back in your generation, here directly, oh, uh, when I'm generating my data set, Here directly, you need to continue to continue <coughs> and continuously load information and provide to your corpus to generate a better uh, space vector. That's why I said to you, uh, with Louis, we are generating a space vector about billion words. And how we did that? How we are doing this kind of thing? We are downloading Wikipedia, Common Core, and uh, news. Mainly, you can find a lot of vocabulary inside of the news because it's daily news. You can find information from Twitter, social network directly. Twitter is incredible, it's really the trash of the world. And, uh, you find a lot of information there, not only about sentences, but about information and knowledge. And you can continue and after say, okay, we'll go to the car market and download directly information from community about this type of topic. You take all the information, you put everything together, you create a big bag of words, you fit this one to Jensen, it creates for you a beautiful space vector, and after you can use directly to find a similarity. You see, at the end of the day, it's not too complicated. But it's really a process of um, how you're going from the data to the information, to the knowledge. Directly. Oh my God. Um, I, I showed you that I was using an LTK, um, Jensen. Why not? I can use uh, Spacy. Spacy, please uh, take a look about this framework. It's very interesting. Um, one of the key elements that I didn't spoke before it's about any element that we are doing, uh, depending on the language. I am using French language, English, Spanish, whatever. German, Dutch, and you have for each type of language a different type of framework that you can use. If I'm coming back quickly on the um, core NLP, I can here. you have here in the core NLP some elements like Arabic, Chinese, English, French, German, and Spanish, and for each one you get tools or not, depending on the language, because it's an open source, and you need to find for each language which one you really need to use. And um, please go directly, not, um, you can take a look about the universities who are working on this type of tools and framework in the country where you want to find the language. If I maybe want to work with the Chinese, I will maybe not use this one, but 
try to find a university in China who is working on this one and create the framework because people know better the language than any person here in Stanford directly. Um, I'm coming back here. Spacey, very good, very industrial story as they are saying, but very, very good, very easy to use English. This one is really to use in English if you want to work. Um, that's mainly the tools and look at the, the organization and what we call the, the co-reference and the relationship and the post-tagging and the tokenization of any elements. Um, project based here is what we call the big one. It's uh, two words, who are at the end of the day, one word. And you've got monogram, big one, two one, this kind of elements. Uh, as like New York, as we explained to you, and you need to find uh, working on these elements. Another uh, type of system that you can use directly is um, we were really speaking from now about using framework directly to create yourself what you really want to achieve. But you can use API or services online. And Retai is a company who is providing a framework to let you directly uh, working with a sentence and extract from the sentence what's the meaning. And I said meaning, remember, what's the context, what's the, the intent, and uh, what's the entities you want to extract to uh, doing what we call the slot feeling, finding the right element and to put in the right place in the forms to create the query. Uh, you can use directly retail, you've got some other framework that you've got online. This one is from Facebook. This other one is from Microsoft with Louis. It's exactly the same. Uh, two tools who are exactly the same one at the end of the day that you can use. And what I'm showing you all of the possibilities is just because at the end of the day, you need to create your voice system. When they say voice system, it's, like, it's about the, the TV show. And you need to create uh, the election to have many algorithms who will work on it and say, what's at the end of the day? Is it about the weather? Is it about maintenance? Is it about uh, asking about the recipe? Or is it just a classification to say about the sentiment analysis? Is it just a classification to say um, in the finance, is it stock market or more about the company or whatever information you get Louis from Microsoft. For each one you really need to use and practice to be sure to understand pretty well, extract the information and come back at the same level at the end of the day. It's really how you create an agnostic system. You have many paths who will provide you at the end of the day the same information about the domain the context, the intent, and um, the post tagging and um, the sorting of your sentence. <coughs> okay, I have that. Uh, where is it? Okay, let me start my Jupyter notebook. Okay. And why not we will come on a particular case that uh, you will be able to train by yourself. Um, it's, uh, we will take the news from the magazine with Walters, uh, finance elements, and we will take a lot of elements from this one, analyze and say at the end of the day where I am in the classification. Imagine you are a human, you receive a lot of information and your manager said to you at the end of the day, I want to have some groups. I want to know where are the groups about the news because I may be not interested from everything today. And um, let me come here, come back on some elements. Uh, yeah. That's the 52 class, classes that I have for the bag of news that I have directly. And coffee, uh, it's about many routers and finance and stock market and the price of the stuff. Platinum, potato, 
uh, cotton, cool, nickel, sugar, this kind of elements. And each time that I have a new article, I want to define, are you speaking about sugar? Or are you speaking about cotton? Or are you speaking about potato, platinum? Because at the end of the day, you will be maybe not the same team who will work on it. And you can ask me, okay, seems pretty clear, but how you can use this type of system in the real life? Imagine about customer support. You are a customer of Amazon. And at the time you have an issue with Amazon, you have, you got a problem that you want to solve and you send an email to Amazon. And you think that there is some human who will receive the email and we will read the email and say, okay, I can answer this one, this one. And the system, and you receive the email very quickly, you say, oh my gosh, the customer relationship and the efficiency of Amazon is pretty good. This may be not a human who did the job. It's a machine, machine learning, and the learning who did it. Because while you are sending your email, it will analyze the title of your email. It will analyze the time when you send the email. It will analyze what was your history with the company. It will analyze what's the content of the body of your email. And it know by the past that there was a lot of people who just send an email to have more details about where is my purchase? Where are my products? I receive a product who is broken. I never received my, my product. And you can directly have the element, create the classification, and when you define with a high level of accuracy that it's about just to have more details about this product, you need to find what's the product inside of the email. How are you doing that? I just explained to you. You find the entities who are inside of your email. And I know that I'm speaking about maybe, I don't know, any product that you can find on Amazon. And I find it, I have all the information, I can send you directly the whole information about the product through email. And you say, oh my gosh, Amazon are pretty, pretty freaking good to send me back the information. But it was a machine and how it's working, it's exactly the same strategy as we will discover here. And this first deep neural network is what we call uh, multi-layer password uh, classification. We will use just dense layers to classify articles. And when I say article, it's not about articles, but it's more about paragraph and group of words. Exactly the same level of words that you got in an average email. It's why you can use this one exactly to do the same type of work for classification of article, news, maybe post on Facebook, Twitter, or emails directly, or chatbot. Pretty the same strategy to have at the end of the day. And you know a particular uh, algorithm and neural network, this kind of elements, and you can apply in different type of hardware. First of all, we will, as usual, directly download all the information and about my mat matplotlib because I will want, I will ask at the end of the day to see if I have some overfitting about my neural network. If I'm turning too much my neural network, because you remember what I explained uh, some weeks ago, that at the end of the day, uh, at the end you don't need to go at too much level of epoch of your neural network for the training. You need to know exactly where you need to stop and when you need to continue. Just to provide you a feedback about that, I created a factory of a model. During the time that I'm here, I have my servers who are working for me. And uh, I just calculated more than 40,000 models in one month. It's a lot of models. And after, I just received the, uh, the conclusion for each one and I can decide, okay, is it a right one or not? And if I am, if I've got some overfitting, if the accuracy is pretty good, and the system is already classified by itself. And I created a system who classify for me, exactly as, as I have an assistant who is doing the job. And um, 
we will use this one for a map probably. After exactly as the previous uh, uh, classes, we use the KWAS directly. Um, I'm using routers directly here because you can have the data set. You don't need to find it directly. Um, you remember in a, in a KWAS, this will be zero as I add. Um, CD. And if I'm going here, I can see that I have my data set. of the data set that was the structure of the data set. But in the case of KOS for the sample, I can directly have this, uh, KOS we will download directly online the element folder. If you are looking directly inside of the uh, KOS folder here at the, um, at the root, you will find all the elements about uh, the data set that I will really use as like the MDist uh, niche. Niche was uh, mainly for text generation that we explained to you C410, EMDB we will come on this one and at the end of the day the routers. Um, but what's the routers? And I will come here to my operating school, deep learning, just because I wanted to show you what's the representation of the routers. Because if you don't understand that directly, you can understand you cannot understand what's the normalization process to why at the classification that you are doing. You need to see what's the representation. And I will just open. Yeah. That's my routers. And routers data set um, has 25,000 items. Each item is defined by. Okay. Each item is defined by a label and the text directly. This one is the first item. I have the label, uh, the, the label and the text, and my text is just a bag of words that I will use. Why not you understand pretty quickly and easily? Because it's just the same, but 25,000 uh, item. That's the first one. And the second one I have, this one is the train, data set and the same one for the test data set exactly the same shape label and content to define uh, what's my text that I need to use okay as I understand this one I will directly after uh, the declaration of my uh, import about the KOS firmware. I'm using the Tiano. You remember you can switch Tiano to TensorFlow with KOS. I will define what's my maximum words and we will come back after on the maximum words and why we are using this one. Do you remember my batch size? Do you remember the batch size? The batch size is how many items I will fit to my neural network iteration after iteration. And the number of epoch global is the number of the loop that I will do for my neural network. And first of all, we will first one create what we call the vocabulary index. What is it? You saw directly in the data set of uh, Reuters that I have a lot of words. And I will just calculate what are the words that I have directly inside of this one. But for each distribution, I will use just one time the word the, and I will not have the number of the, uh, how many times I have the, the word the inside of my data set, and I will have the word and the number of time, what we call the frequency. 
the distribution and the frequency of my work directly off my data set. And I will create directly here my index. And for each word, I will provide a number directly. I will have the index for the word. And how many times I have the word directly? Yes, question. Are you creating a TFID? Yeah, you can, do, you can do this kind of things. But in this case, I did that by myself, just to be sure that you got the whole information and you can understand easily how it's working. Because at the end of the day, you are using TFEDF and you don't understand what it means directly on the back. Um, what is happening here? Uh, very simple, I will use my file going for my file. I will just use li line after line. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to the whole files. For the whole files, I will read each line. And after, for the line, I will just strip, split by the space. It's exactly as like a tokenization. I take all the words and I create a list of all the words based on the space directly between the words. And for each one, I will define um, directly an index at this level. We are not at the level of TFEDF for the moment. We are just to say, okay, the word car is the number 25. And you will understand because after I will represent each item about you, you remember that I had the text inside of each item. And I will switch because the computer do not understand the world, but the computer understands the numbers in the binary stuff. And I will switch each word by a number. Exactly as we did by the past, if you remember for pictures, for image. We use the numbers as the level of the grays between the white and the black to define, OK, in this pixel, is it white, black, or between both? It's exactly the same one here, but it's not the level of the color, but it's the, it's the world, the position of the world in an index. index we are creating the index here, and we will come after to the loading of the data set. <coughs> Here we will load directly the training set and the testing set. We will split between two lists. The first list will be the list about the labels. And the second list is the list of the, the group of the words for each article. And we will transform directly each article to numbers. And we will sort out this one about the classes. And don't worry, we will come back after all the elements and what we are providing at the end of the day. From the data set, we will extract information where the training set, uh, the, the information from the, the, the vectors with representing the text that you've got. The same one about the label, the classes that I extracted directly, because I need to know what are my classes directly, and what's my word index. As I have this one, I can load directly here, and I'm using directly the build uh, vocabulary based on my true text, because I will use the both elements to be sure that I have the position of each word directly. What I'm doing here, I'm just creating vectors. It's why you remember we've got what we call the word embeddings. Word embeddings is mainly representing the relationship uh, of a word with other words. It's what we call word embeddings. And after we've got vectors, vectors for words. It's not the same. A vector of words is mainly about we have a sequence and we can represent this sequence by a vector of number. And each number represents the index of a word in a list. You understand the difference between both. The first one is really about the relationship and the context. The second one is more about the position of a word in an index. We are creating the vocabulary here. And after, we will load directly the data and define, at the end of the day, what's the dimension of each vector with representing my elements. Exactly as we did for the image at the previous class. We decided at the time we will define a limit about the vectors to be sure that any elements have the same shape. Because what? 
each article don't have the same number of words. And we need to define at the time the limit because we cannot fit directly different type of shape in the neural network. We need to define clearly what's the same shape and the same matrix for everyone. And how we will do that? We will just work on the frequency. If you get a word that maybe appear one time, I will not use this one. But if I have a word that will appear <coughs> regularly at high level of frequency, I will use this one. It's why if you remember what I showed you directly before here, uh, we will work on the set circle. Not only for the classes, but for the words too. It's how we will define which one we will use and which one we will not use. Just because about the frequency. If I know that this world is not a frequent world, we don't need to use because the system will not understand to reorganize the weights of the vectors in my neural network. As I did the job, I'm just doing here a print to see what we extracted from the data set. We can see here that we've got um, a training set, a testing set with the number of elements, the word index with the level of the word index directly. That's my index of words we got. The number of the classes that we need to work with. And just if I remember well, that's just here um, vocabulary diction uh, dictionary. It's so just a sample of the, of the dictionary with exchange, got this number, we, this number, etc., etc. The same one with vocabulary as sample. And after, just a sample of my training set. The difference between uh, my sentence that I have in my training set as a word and this one is just I switch any word by the index. This one represents the position of each word in my index. <coughs> and I can do the reverse engineering work at a time if I want. If I, if I have the matrix and the vector with representing a sentence, I can recreate directly the text that I have for this one. But at the end of the day, my computer don't understand words. It's why I need to change to a number. As I did this one, um, I will switch uh, just because I will work with MLP and you will find all the information here we can come back after. But you remember while I was working with picture, we was, work, we was working from pixel to numbers to binary vector, what we call the hot vectors. And I'm doing exactly the same one. I will activate or deactivate the vector directly from the one we had exactly on the top based on the best frequency of uh, 1,000 vectors to come from a vector of number to a vector of binary value. And why not we can use this binary vector to fit my neural network directly and to train my neural network? It's exactly what we will do right now. I'm doing exactly the same one for the labels. And you can see that here I have exactly 52 uh, classes. And I activated the class with the white one. You can see that I have only one. one. And after I'm creating my neural network, my deep neural network, with, in this case, a very simple one with some layers, it's the same sequential based on the dense with 512 uh, passato or no ones. Um, with the input shape with my max word, just because I will fit just a vector about 1,000 elements directly on my, on my neural network. My activation, you remember the volume? Remember the trends? Uh, my dropout. 
Who remember what's a dropout? You remember? Yeah? Like you cut off some of the inputs? Yeah. The dropout is each time that I'm coming back as a recurrent, the recurrency in my neural network, I will uh, drop out 20% of my weights. Just to be sure to not go into the overfit. And you need to play with, you need to change this value. It's very, very important. And after, I will come back to a dance with the number of the case, with 52 new whole case, and create my activation as a soft max, because we will understand that after, it will provide us a probability for each one, but you will be not able directly to provide us which one, which class is selected at the end of the day for my classification. And this way we will use the softmax to come back with the wild classification that we got at the end of the day. And when we will compile our model, we will use the optimizer with the ADAM and the metrics about the accuracy with the cross entropy as we did before. And if I'm coming back directly here, I have exactly the same description globally. And I can go here, why now, at the step where I will fit my model with the information. You can see that I have my model that I just created. And I will fit my training information where my data set about the text, my labels. But don't forget that each one, why now, for each item, are not a vector of where, they are hot vectors for each one. The number of epochs, the batch size, the verbosity, who is just, I want to have the feedback from my neural network training to see what is happening directly. This one is very important because don't forget that it's with this information that you can detect if you are doing on overfitting or not. And you need to take a look at this one to say, okay, why not I need to stop? But you can create some algorithm. We will take a look for you and detect automatically if you are going on the on overfit. In my case, when I'm training uh, with 500 epoch, I'm doing some algorithm to be sure to stop directly if I'm riding at the level I don't need to do. And I try to understand for a factory if I can define the, the right accuracy regarding my hyperparameters to be sure that which one is the right level of the epoch to train my model. And, uh, yeah. In whole case, we've got 10 epochs, as you can see here. As my model is trained, I can evaluate with the information the information that I'm using for this one is the information from the testing data set. It's exactly the same one as um, the feeding for the training data set, but I will use the other one and validate the result and print directly the score of my neural network. And you can see in the whole case that we've got globally a loss function at the end of the day um, with 43% with an accuracy of classification of 91%. It means that for each article, for 10 articles, you will be able to classify 9 on 10. Seems to be very impressive for workers, information who are coming directly. And we will take a look to see if it's right or not. And for that, what I will do, I will just uh, create a new uh, matrix, just because we are working on the, mat uh, on the vector sorry, of uh, 1,000 elements. Um, it's just, in this case, a vector of 0, 1,000 uh, vector of 0. And I will take in the range, I will take uh, 10 elements in this range, and I will fit directly elements. and here asking for the prediction based on the model that I trained. And don't forget that you can save your model directly as a binary file. And you can load after if you want. You don't need to do that directly. 
the other big issue here, I cannot show you directly the text because I didn't do in, in this pass. But I can see what's my prediction and what's the result of my testing element. I have the 43, uh, and, uh, the 43 and 43. It's perfect. The one was good. The second is, is OK. The third is OK. Four, two. The next, OK. 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 This one was wrong. That one. Is okay and okay. We can see that it's exactly what we was expecting. Nine users who are okay and one who is wrong. And we took directly by random element from my testing set, and it was exactly what we was expecting. But don't forget that it's maybe not the case for each time. You really need to validate to train and to. Be sure that at the end of the day, what you will provide to, to your customer or company is exactly what you are expecting. And to take a look about this one, we can see, you remember the article that I presented to you last, last week about uh, the accuracy and my loss function. It seems that I don't have any graffiti. This one I'm really working pretty well. And if I'm coming back here, if I have some overfitting, I will maybe have at the time some evolution as like that, maybe, or like that, or maybe like that. This can be interesting. In the whole vision here, directly you can see in one time that the training was pretty good. Okay? And it's how we are creating just a classification. And in this case, if you remember well, it's a classification about 52 classes directly from article. And yesterday, Google announced um, what we call the smart reply. It's exactly the same type of technology and strategy. Pretty sure that Google are working on really more data than only uh, 20,000 data. But at the end of the day, it's exactly this type of strategy. Any question? Is it okay? Point one. <laughs> Louis, any question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so great. Um, you have six or seven layers or five layers. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think we've got here just two or three layers. It's, um, because you 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 have inside of the presentation. Okay, so what is the intuition behind this? How come you are going only with two? Because it is said that if you have more layers, the accuracy of your uh, RNN will yeah, be much. That, that's exactly what you need to test. And uh, it's uh, very difficult at this level to explain you. Um, you really need to, to train your own model and to understand. And it really depends about the level of the neurons that you will have, the level of the layers that you will have inside of your model. In this case, I really started from the sample from Keras to be as close as possible from what you've got online. And, um, but uh, you can have some layers if you want to see if the system will more understand uh, what's the, the construction of the weight between all the elements because it will fit directly each layer with the information and we calculate in real time what's the, the weight of each element. There is, to be confident with you about the level of the training that I made during the last month, um, hyperparameters don't seem uh, to have a big impact on uh, hyperparameters. Yeah, the hyperparameters globally. Um, what can really change uh, the number of the layers? What is the number of the layers? It's exactly what I'm doing for the moment. If you are changing the number of epoch, epoch seems to have some impact, but not too much. Um, Perceptron, the number of neurons, same one. 
um, what I change to um, the organization and the, the cascade of the elements, same one, but if you are adding some elements, you can have huge difference. But it's very interesting because in the case of text classification, I created a very, I don't remember, six, eight levels between convolutional network and LSTM, and um, the accuracy was not pretty good. And when I was working with the two or three layers, with only dense, I had better results. I arrived at 94% uh, of uh, accuracy for classification, and one of the last model I trained yesterday with the convolutional network with uh, directly many LSTM after, I had 78% of accuracy. And your input vector was just exactly the same thing that you instructed here, or was it different? Um, as you can imagine, it's different, but at the end of the day, it's globally the same type of idea. So how could you rationalize these, I mean, the two results that you got? Wow. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's really, in my, in my case, I think that I may be too young to have uh, a good answer about that. Um, but I'll talk about it later. Greg, I have an answer. Because <laughs> I'm old enough to answer. <laughs> it's an art, not a science. Really? Okay. So, I mean, it's finding the right architecture for each of these things. I mean, that's what guys in research do all day long. That's pretty much all they do. Take the same pieces and you send one differently and we look at this part and it works. And then they tune, tune the things when I promise to go up to, to sort of scrape the last percent. But the big one is, oh, I found the right architecture for that problem. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, that that's really I think at, at the end of the day it's really a good point to say that it's more now that really a science. But uh, I hope that we can really define that one as a science. That's why I'm creating for the manufacturer who is doing the job and analyze the job for me because as a human, it's completely impossible. Uh, it really has too much time to, to, to do that and to try the model and try to understand. Uh, it's too much data for a human to understand. Um, another um, element that I understood from this one was about the number of uh, layers, but you need quickly to find what's the right average of the number of epoch you need to do. And I think it's really two points that you really need to work on it. Um, and the epoch is directly in relationship with um, uh, the number of items you will fit directly inside of your neural network. It's really two key points if you want to improve your system, but you will see at the time that you really have um, the, the, the schema at the end of the presentation is pretty clear about that, but I, I really like this one. You can see that you have a lot of people that you are working but arriving at the time, you don't have a lot of progress. And I will say that at the end of the day, this part, maybe you don't need to continue to train your model because Depending about what you want to achieve, you will maybe have a difference of 0 0.01. I don't think it's really important for your business and what you want to do. And the right game is really to find where to stop here directly. But I have some of my friends who came from the scientist part of the, of the world for deep learning. And their job is really to find how to improve from this level. Because it's a game. Now looking at it from a practical point of view, not scientific, let's say if you wanted to, if you're solving, um, if you're solving a problem at office, right, for which you have to ge generate revenue, and you don't have time to do that kind of uh, improvement, what is the best way to um, uh, tackle this problem of increasing your performance? In other words, based on what, what you just mentioned and following the 80-20 rule, would you go... Do you suggest to, let's say, create four different architectures solving the same problem and choose the best one? Or would you, let's say, choose one architecture, add layers, or one architecture, 
more perceptrons and um, hyperparameters and whatnot. Uh, I will answer that. In my case, my vision is I don't want to have any minutes where my GPU are not working. It's how you industrialize the testing and the training of your models. I think it's really one of the key points. And you know, the, 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 the cycle we form with my team, we are, the, we are working daily. We, why don't we know exactly how many models regarding the hyperparameters um, the GPU can train, and we've got two for the moment, and we, are, we know approximately that the system can train this model during 24 hours. And we've got a point at 9 a.m. each day, and we take the result, we take a look about the summary of any elements from the models we train, and we said, okay, we will try a new, new batch of models. And yeah, it's really depending on what you really want to achieve because at the end of the day, globally your application will use maybe not only one model. But in our case, I think that in the case of Louis, in his team, I don't know how many models you've got, but it's a lot. Yeah. And uh, in our case, I don't remember how many we got exactly, but a lot too. And it's not one, two, or three, or four, or five, it's 20, 40 models we are using for different type of tasks. And an advice that I, maybe I can provide you, don't try to create a model where we do too much things. Just really take a particular task and say, I will ask to this model to do only this task and no more than that. Because if you are expecting too much, you will do a bad job and not a good job. Thank you. Oui? Well, one idea is, if you want to figure out the right architecture, you want to go on the right community and ask the question. There's a lot of people who have solved problems that are similar and they will you know, not have all the same opinion, but I think you get people who you know, with similar things, that's the option of one. If you're a large company with good resources, put a problem on Kaggle. Have you heard of Kaggle? <laughs> so put the problem and you let guys <laughs> fight over it on a you know small subset of the analysis and then you look at the solution and then you bring it home and you you know <laughs> you you beat it up. So that's that was a two ideas. Okay. Yeah no, no question. We should talk about home oh, yeah. yeah yeah we can we can I don't know if you if you have some question regarding yeah, this one we can continue to, to speak a lot about that. And as you understood today text classification, text analysis, and that your language processing are really a full-time job and that you need to, to work on, you need to understand, and you can have a lot of exchange about uh, these type of things, and, but why not you need to train, and I think that to come and arrive at the workshop, one of the first ones is really focused on Gen C and uh, this kind of thing. So, a couple of things. Yeah, we need to Yeah. Okay. How do we use this? Hello. Whoa. It's like magic. Magic. Alright, uh, let's do, yeah, do the, do the little dot on the left. Do the little dot. Otherwise, it's going to be real big. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a science to this? Hold on. <laughs> so they can't, they can't. Don't block it. Do you see the, the very tip of it? The, the orange tip of it on the very, um, yeah, the camera looks at that, so if you're covering that, it can't So this is my question. What is this? Sigma. Sigma is a good answer, but that's not the one I expect. It has to do with people. It's a learning curve. Okay? So let's be clear. You guys are sitting here right now because we've been feeding you theory and Greg has tried to save you by give you real practice and real practical advice and show you how it's done. And we give you what, two exercises, I think? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, wow, but that was not a long time. Did you guys do it? Did you guys do the uh, IPython notebook? Yes? Does it make sense? If not, you talk to this guy. But yes? 
Okay, so we're going to give you, I think we're going to send you that's right, all the details and all the corners and stuff for the next homework. The trick now is to jump in the water. It's a little cold at the beginning, but then it gets really good. Okay, so you have to do, you can't just like, you know, learn cool stuff and, you know, the interesting example you can repeat in the body and so on, it's, you know, you jump and do it. So you'll be amazed how quickly you get here. Okay? Because once you've done a few weird examples and you really understand what's going on, and then you're comfortable with you know, tweaking your model, Greg is showing you uh, tweaking the data around it. Oh, I can feed my own data. I understand enough to take you know, my other data set and feed it. You'll be here. Because then, remember, you're basically borrowing from other people. I mean, that's the beauty of something like deep learning. There's this huge community that's created all these things. It's all out there. It's all available. There's you know, trained model, examples. It, it's all there. You just have to get from, I understand what it's about, to I've done it. And I've done it a couple of times, and it will take you from here to there. Okay? So we're going to send you uh, homework in various forms. We're going to figure out how to do this and how to help you guys and how to try for us. But you know, the goal is to take you here very quickly. Yes? No? Yes. Maybe? He's good. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, I Promise? think that um, we had at the break a very interesting discussion about, OK, can we do maybe something very interesting? Maybe just where to go to about the back of school. Uh, if I'm going to the your website and because at the end of the day find someone who makes sense for you and if I'm going to the FAQ of the school, why not correct a boat who can answer up to any question about the school directly? It's not so hard. It's not so easy, but after today you've got all the tools to do that. But because there is not a lot of vocabulary it's not so complicated. There is no million questions. There is no big context or domain. You can really do that. How you can create a boat? Imagine that I want to create a boat or Messenger or maybe Slack or Skype to speak with and asking just questions. I don't want to have the relationship between two questions. But how can you do that? If you are thinking about all the information that I provided to you today, first step is what? What you need to do as a first step? Collect the data. First one. To do that, we've got two possibilities. You are going to this guy and say, do you have the text file with the whole information that you've got here? Or maybe you said, I don't want to ask to this guy. Because in the real life, I will not have this guy directly on my side to ask him that. Cut the tool to directly go on the website, grab the data, and come back to the text file to you. And as you've got this one, cut the relationship between each question and the answer. You need to find how you can do that. How you can cut the relationship between each question and the text is directly after. Thinking just some time, take some seconds to think about that. How you can recreate the structured data from the unstructured data we got here? It seems that the data here are not structured, but they are. Oh. Those question marks. Pattern. Exactly. And how you can find this one? The question marks? Yeah. Well, if you look at the pattern, it maybe starts with a capital letter and ends with a question mark. More simple than that? You know, sometimes it's obvious directly in front of us and you say, oh my gosh. So the font size? Maybe. Font mm -hmm. size, you know. Exactly. You are going directly in the HTML and you said, okay, you can use a tool as like beautiful soup or I don't know exactly which one. Very simple, you take the page, you are looking about the DOM of your HTML page and you can find the data directly here. 
sometimes I have people who say, go ahead, we need to train uh, the data set, but the data are on the website after a, uh, a login and password, and you need to browse inside of a list. My gosh, it's complicated, we need to do that. Please don't. We have a lot of tools to do that for us. Okay? I will not provide you all the tools you need to find by yourself because at the end of the day, the life is that. But you are a team. And please work together as a team. I can be maybe in a, in a team. I will be in a team of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to be on your team. <laughs> and um, you have a lot of tools that you can use directly, going very quickly. Last time, one of my colleagues called me and said, I have uh, an intranet for the company, all the data are there, if I'm calling the, the CTO of the company, you need to wait maybe one month to have the data. I said, what's the login password? He gave me, and the day after, I called and said, OK, I have all the data right now. I said, thank you, guy. It's how you are efficient. You need to be smart to find the path to do that. You collect all the data. As you've got all the data, what you can do? You train directly your space vector through GenSim. And you are using directly the functionality of GenSim to ask me exactly as I did with what's the weather. Do I need to take a quote? The first sentence will be each time title of your self-rubric, and your question you just ask to the system. And you can arrive to show you the, the result that you did exactly that with the Keras community. I took the whole website of the Keras community, I downloaded the content, and why not, when I'm asking for something, you will provide me directly the link of the web page <laughs> with the accuracy. And I, I showed, we, we took a look about that because you can see that here I have 100% of accuracy, um, 89 89.5, how can I run KWAS on GPU? And uh, my question, what do I need to run KWAS on GPU? Any phone web? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's here. But if I'm coming back on this one, I say, hey, buddy, how can I install KOS? Very familiar, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I'm not sure about the answer. He provided me with the, the right one. But if I was only working on the accuracy, I would say, that's not the right one. Because look at the accuracy, it's 62. Person. And you need to work on this one to just write exactly as I did for KOS. And just to explain you, I, I think that I created this one on some hours. Very easy. I know. I have the knowledge and I can do that very easily. But I think you can do exactly the same one inside of Slack as a chatbot. To go directly inside of the FAQ. And not only for you, but maybe at the time for any student who said, OK, I'm at a button. And What's the document I need to fill right now? Or, uh, what, can I need, what do I need to provide for my next workshop? And you can create the knowledge as a data set to answer directly. And you can, at the end of the day, recreate exactly the same user experience as we start. Why not have this one for for Burton School? It's in your head. Why now take your power, create that one for the button? First workshop. What do you think? The, the oh, first. Uh, the okay. first one. First one. Yeah. Everybody? It's a, it's a Maybe you can create some elements and see what the result is. Yes. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about the conditions. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. I mean, no, I'm sorry.
Yeah, the lyrics for that. Okay, how about kids? Uh, kids are going to get the deal or something at school? Are you supposed to be able to? No, I think you can. So we should, we should go through. <coughs> so, uh, so, um, so, I think we will put something together. Yeah, in writing, so that we can share the information and stuff. I mean, I like this idea, it's just, I'm thinking, it may be cool to have the whole group do it, mm -hmm. but then it's not a homework that you can be, you know, sort of, whatever you call it, you know. You can't do it or something, because you're going to be on the 31st or 32nd of, you know, the whole thing, so. But that would be very cool, because you, you know, you would trace on the website. Cool. Okay. So but this one was more an idea after our discussion. Yeah, yeah. And we had at the back. Uh, that's, that's cool. That's a good idea. That's, I mean, these days, you, know, you go to a meetup, and the question to ask is, who is not working on the chatbot? <laughs> <laughs> and three hands go up. Okay. <laughs> so it's definitely the thing to, 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 to get your hands into. Um, okay. We will send you within days. I better be within days because Saturday I'm going to print again for London. So uh, within days, uh, we'll send you uh, the first batch of things to try. Yeah. And then we'll get more and more ambitious mm -hmm. and we'll find a way to get yeah. you guys to us to help you with it. So, yes? Once and twice. Okay. Thank you okay. for all the work. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Any any question about um, about today the class? Is it okay? Please just turn yes. Um, I saw notes that the previous classes were on the GitHub repo. Yeah, you can you can find uh, the whole content directly on uh, GitHub. You get directly all the elements, and we will provide. And it does exactly the same time, I think, for uh, the homework, <coughs> all the elements you get, the, the presentation, and the um, Python and Emacbook. Yeah. Should we tell? When you see someone doing things starting at zero, <laughs> you know what language they could have. <laughs> <laughs> That's zero. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you everyone.